Welcome. This meeting of the Lincoln City Council, a meeting as a Board of Equalization, is called to order. In accordance with LB 898, a copy of the Open Meetings Act is posted in the back of the chambers. Let's all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of silent med meditation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, first order of business is an election of the chair for the Board of Equalization meeting. I'd entertain a motion. Move that Larry and Gailey Baird be the chair of the Board of Equalization. Second. Okay. Moved by Trent and seconded by Roy. Uh, please call the roll. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Bellers? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Rabel? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Next, I'll read the items into the record. They are the College View Maintenance Business Improvement District, generally extending from South 48th Street between Calvert, Calvert Street and Pioneers Boulevard, Havelock Street Maintenance Business Improvement District, generally extending from Havelock Avenue from Cornhusker Highway on the west to 64th Street on the east, North 27th Street Maintenance Business Improvement District, generally extending from North 26th Street on the west to North 28th Street on the east, and from the center line of O Street on the north to Fair Street on the south, primarily including those properties abutting North 27th Street. South Street Maintenance Business Improvement District, generally extending from South Street from the alley west of 9th Street, east to 19th Street. University Place Maintenance Business Improvement District, generally extending along North 48th Street from Colby Street on the south to the half block north of Adams Street on the north and along St. Paul Avenue from North 47th Street to North 50th Street and the West O Street Maintenance Business Improvement District, generally along West O Street from 3rd Street on the east to Homestead Expressway on the west and including the property abutting the north and south sides of said West O Street right-of-way. And just to clarify a little context, each year the Lincoln City Council passes a number of improvement district ordinances, and today we are here as the Board of Equalization to equalize the assessments for several such districts as read by the clerk. The land described in each district is benefited by the improvements in the particular district, and the cost of these districts is then paid by the city through its special assessment revolving fund. It is then necessary for the city to recoup its costs from the benefited property owners and reimburse its revolving fund. These costs or assessments are computed by the Urban Development Department and presented to the City Council for its review when sitting as the Board of Equalization, as we are now. Uh, after, uh, we'd like to bring up a representative from the Urban Development Department um, to make a brief <coughs> statement about each of the districts and then following that, anyone who wishes to testify may please come forward and just sign in after giving your testimony, please. All right, welcome. My name is Ron Kane. I'm with the Urban Deve Development Department. And five of the districts have previously been assessed. Um, and then the, the assessments that are before you today are based on the time period January 1 through December 31st of 2016. West O Street is undergoing its first assessment and was approved by resolution by council in 2016. So the time period being assessed for this district is actually going to be June 24th through December 31st, 2016. And I'm here to answer, try to answer any questions you may have on any of these assessments. Any questions for Ron? All right, thank you very much. Would anyone else like to come forward and testify on these items? All right, seeing none, Teresa. All right, if not, we can vote to assess these items as they stand. Madam Chair, I move we adopt all of the assessed districts. Uh, Second. Okay, the motion to accept the assessed districts was presented by John and seconded by Roy. Any further discussion? Right, please call the roll. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Fellers? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Rebold? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Then we just need a motion to adjourn. I so move. <laughs> Finally die. Second. Okay, moved by a lot of people, but we'll go with Trent and seconded by Thank you. Roy. <laughs> uh, all right. 
Do we need to vote or are we done? No, we need to vote. Okay, Cam? let's call the roll. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Fellers? Yes. Gaylor Beard? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Okay. Now we'll move into the, oh, well, I guess we are adjourned as a Board of Equalization. We'll move into the council, regular council meeting and the order of business for the city council meeting is as follows. The clerk will read the items listed on the agenda under public hearing, and anyone who wishes to speak on an item should come forward after that item has been read. The applicant and those in favor should speak first, followed by those who are opposed. The applicant may then make a short rebuttal, and we would ask that speakers please sign in following giving your comments uh, into the pink slip of paper at the microphone. Testimony is limited to five minutes per speaker. As a reminder, the timer will sound after four minutes, and after all public hearings, the council will vote on resolutions and items listed under third reading. On the second and last Mondays of the month, immediately prior to adjournment, anyone may speak on any issue, uh, not on today's agenda, nor planned for a future agenda. Courtesy and decorum are expected of all who come before this body. We would ask that no one approach city staff without permission from the council, and please no applauding, booing, or other expression of support or opposition except through your testimony. All cell phones should be turned off and private conversations taken outside the chamber. Uh, and during the week, if you have questions regarding an agenda item, feel free to contact any of us on the council. Patrice, would you please call the first item? Yes, our first item will be our public hearing consent agenda, items one through 10. Would anyone like to speak on any of the items on the consent agenda? I think we have one appointment, Shane Meininger. Okay. If you would please come forward. Hello, I'm Shane Meininger. And, State your address, please, for uh, the record. The address that they have listed is actually not what my current address is. It's 4201 West A is my old address. And do I need to report my you new address? Give us your current one for the yes. record. We'll yep. get that fixed. It's Thank you. It's 6300 Southwest 91st Street, Denton, 68339. Well, thank you for coming down. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your interest in this particular um, um, board? I've been sprinkler and chemical examining board. I've had a fire sprinkler company in Lincoln since 2005, and they asked me to be on the board before, but there was somebody else on it, and then they called me here recently and asked me to be on the board now, and so I told them I would do it. Well, thank you very much for your willingness to serve. Any questions? Any right. Okay. Well, thank, thank you for you. coming down today. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to this item? Okay, uh, Teresa, please. All right. Take a seat. If not, we can vote on these items. Items one and two were introduced by Eskridge. So moved. Second. Second by Roy. Discussion. Please call the roll. Fellers. Yes. Gaylor Baird. Yes. Lamb. Yes. Raybould. Yes. Camp. Yes. Christensen. Yes. Eskridge. Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Then items three, four and seven and eight were introduced by fellers so moved second seconded by jane discussion please call the roll fellers yes gaylor baird yes lamb yes Raybold. yes camp yes christensen yes eskridge yes motion carried seven to zero next then our public hearing liquor resolutions those giving testimony are asked to come forward Raise their right hand for the clerk to administer the oath. After the oath, witnesses shall state their names and addresses. I will call items 11 and 12 together. They're the application of bread and cup for a Class C liquor license at 440 North 8th Street, as well as the related manager application of Kevin Shin. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth as you verily believe it to be? I Thank do. Thank you. Welcome. My name is Nick Cusick, uh, recent uh, purchaser along with some investors uh, in Bread and Cup. Uh, Kevin uh, and his wife have been involved in Bread and Cup for over 10 years, or I think this is the 10th year, and uh, Kevin is staying on as the uh, liquor manager, and I'm the uh, manager of the LLC that owns Bread and Cup. So Great. operating on a temporary liquor permit right now. Would you mind just stating your address for the record? Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's Nick Cusick. Uh, 6400 West Shore Drive is my home address, 68516. 
Thank you. Any questions? Carl? No? Uh, since Kevin's the guy with, with the license, I guess he's, should, we should hear from him. <laughs> I'm Kevin Shin, uh, 356 South 53rd Street in Lincoln. Okay. Yes. Well, thanks, Kevin. Right. Thanks, for, thanks for what you do and the, the unique, uh, unique venue that you provide to the community. So, and you've been in practice for a long time. Several of us are in the, serve on the Internal Liquor Committee. I don't re ever remember anything relative to Bread and Cup. You do a great job. Thank right. you. Thanks, Carl. All right. All right. Well, thank you for coming down today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak to this item? Seeing none, please call the next item, Teresa. All right. Next are items 13 and 14. They're the application of Big Red Restaurant and Sports Bar for a Class C liquor license at 8933 Andermatt Drive and the related manager application of Troy Olson. Raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth as you really believe it to be? Yes. Thank you. I am uh, Bill Harvey. I'm one of the owners of Endgame Management, uh, Endgame Operating Group, and uh, we're opening a new Big Red restaurant and sports bar. We're actually building it now, and our proposed open date is June 1st. Uh, at least, uh, knock on wood, that's what we're hoping for. And we, um, we're opening at the corner, well, there's a <coughs> development, uh, a commercial development at 84th and Highway 2 here in Lincoln. And we're opening on one of, the, one of the lots there out in front of the Menards store. So we're very excited uh, to be uh, opening our second location in Lincoln. We've had our original location open now for about 20 years. So um, we're very much looking forward to that. Troy Olson is going to be our manager for that location. Troy has uh, been with our company for a number of years. For the last eight years, he's been our liquor license manager in Norfolk, Nebraska, and our very successful uh, restaurant uh, there and before that Troy actually managed our restaurant out on West O Street for several years So he's been a liquor license manager here before in Lincoln Could you just give us the address of the new establishment for the record? Yes, thank 8933 Andermatt Drive. Great. Thank you. Any questions from the council? All right. Thank you for coming down. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to speak to this item? Seeing none, please call the next item, Teresa. All right, I'll call items 15 and 16 together. They're the application of Talon Room for a Class CK liquor license at 230 North 12th Street, Suite 1, and the related manager application of Matthew Rogi. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth as you verily believe it to be? I do. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, my name is Matt Rogi. My address is 1540 Garrett Lane, apartment 211. Lincoln, Nebraska, 68512. Um, I recently purchased the Talon Room from Chef Ah Chef LLC. I was with Chef Ah Chef and still am, mainly operating under their catering uh, company. Just as a part time while I'm getting the Talon Room back up, um, Aaron Young, the owner of Chef Ah Chef, and myself, we kind of partnered together to work that out. And I was the director of the Talon Room. And when the opportunity arised, I decided to take over with my own company. Uh, my fiance, Nicole Rabine, and I are the owners of Seven Diamonds LLC, and we operate the talent room together, so. Well, any questions from the council? Carl. Yeah, tell, so tell us about the talent room, uh, what it is, what, it, what it's gonna be. Sure. Um, yeah. The talent room is an event space in the old Spaghetti Works building, 230 North 12th Street, suite number one. Uh, we do mostly weddings and private events. Uh, we are opening up more public events to uh, operate during the week more often. And um, we are also looking to do offsite uh, beverage catering as well. So uh, that's our main operation. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for coming down. Thank you. Wish you the best of luck. Would anyone else like to speak to this item? Please call the next time, Teresa. All right, next are items 17 and 18, application of Fat Jack's Barbecue for a Class IK liquor license at 101 Southwest 14th Street and the related manager application of Jacqueline Burt. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth as you really believe it to be? Yes. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Burt. I am a member owner of Fat Jack's Barbecue. Um, address is 6232 Northwest 5th Street, 68521. Okay. And 
Would you like to tell us a little more about the... Um... Sure. We have been in business for nine years as a restaurant. Um, currently moved to our lo new location on West O two months ago, um, where we will have a location large enough that we would like to serve beer because it goes great with barbecue. Okay. Any questions? Cindy. Hi, thanks for being here today. So I appreciate the fact that you are working with Companion Link to put some folks to work out there at Fat mm -hmm. Jack's, and I've heard great things. Is it going well? Very well. We have Good. been very blessed. They are great team members, and um, I can't imagine it worked out better beyond our expectations. Good to know. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Thank you so much for coming down. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to this item? Please call the next item, Teresa. All right, next is item 19, manager application of Peter Clark for Marketplace IGA <coughs> at 4646 West Huntington Avenue. Hello. Hi. Would you raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth as you verily believe it to be? I do. Thank you. Uh, my name is Peter Clark. I live at uh, 940 Pine Ridge Road, Crete, Nebraska, 68333. And I've owned the grocery store out in Air Park for 10 years, and I'm applying to be the manager out there. Any questions? Well, thank you for coming down. Would anyone else like to testify on these items, this item? Seeing none, please call the next item, Teresa. All right, next is item 20, manager application of Robert Miller for Huskerville Pub and Pizza at 2805 Northwest 48th Street. Good afternoon. Oh, pardon me. Quite all right. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give us the truth as you verily believe it to be? Yes. Thank you. My name is Bob Miller. Uh, my address is uh, 5130 West Sparrow Lane in Lincoln, Nebraska, 68528. And this is for the uh, liquor manager for Huskerville Pub and Pizza out in Air Park there. Um, had a vacated position in the LLC. Jason Neiman uh, originally held this uh, manager position. He got married and moved to Wyoming. So... My wife and I took his place, bought into the LLC, and that's how this all came to be. Any questions? Congratulations. Thanks all for right. coming down. Thank you very much, guys. Would anyone else like to testify on these items? All right, please call the next item. All right, next is item 21, manager application of Jay Gates for Applebee's Neighborhood Grill and Bar at 3730 Village Drive, 6100 O Street, Unit 308, and 3951 North 27th Street. Did you raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth as you really believe it to be? I do. Thank you. My name is Jay Gates. I'm the Director of Risk Management for RMH. We operate 175 Applebee restaurants in 15 states, including all 11, or not all, but 11 Applebee's here in the state of Nebraska and our previous Chief Administrative Officer who left the company at the end of the year. Um, left word for me to take over the liquor <laughs> license, so that's why I'm here. Okay. Any questions? Thank you for being here today. Right. Would anyone else like to speak to this, this item? Right. Please call the next time. All right, next is item 22, application of Whole Foods Market Nebraska, LLC, for a special designated license to cover an outdoor area measuring approximately 100 feet by 100 feet at Whole Foods Market at 6055 O Street on May 20th between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Welcome. Just state your Hi. name and address. Uh, my name is Leslie Smith. I live at 1260 Belmont Avenue, Lincoln, 68521. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the event? Um, we are doing a seafood boil, and we would like to do the event outside in a barricaded area in our parking lot so we can have a Zydeco band and beer on tap with the seafood boil. Okay. Any questions? John. Just out of curiosity, Ms. Smith, uh, you've got some neighbors there to the south. Is this anything that might be disruptive to those neighbors later hours? Um, we're only going to be doing the uh, event from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for Thank being here. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Please call the next item, Teresa. Next is item 23, application of SMG Food and Beverage, LLC, for a special designated license to cover an outdoor area measuring approximately 700 feet by 448 feet at the Pinewood Bowl Theater at 4201 South Coddington on May 18th, 19th, and 20th. 
June 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 15th, 16th, and 17th, July 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, and 29th, and August 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 19th, 20th, and 21st, between 6 a.m. and 2 a.m. Good afternoon. I'm Tom Lorenz, General Manager with Pinnacle Bank Arena, and we also do the uh, Pinewood Bowl concerts. Uh, this is our opportunity to request SDLs to do the uh, alcohol service out at Pinewood Bowl. Uh, the SDLs requested today uh, cover the first 10 shows we've announced. There's potentially another two or three that we'll be adding later. Um, the area that we'll serve alcohol within is a uh, fenced area at Pinewood Bowl. Uh, this is our sixth year of doing concerts out there. This also allows us to do a bit in the backstage area. Um, very successful uh, concert series, and we support, uh, we love the support we get from Lincoln. And I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Carl. Thank you. Um, Tom, how many years have we been doing concerts at Pinewood Bowl? So this will be our sixth year. We're, uh, it's gone very quickly. Yeah. And uh, it, uh, we've had uh, been able to do some upgrades out in the bowl along with uh, parks and some different things. And so people will see uh, a, a little bit of a new look, but uh, the bowl itself is still very much intact. And uh, the artists love it as much as the uh, patrons do. Mm -hmm. I'm very green out there this year. <laughs> it is green. <laughs> yeah. We were just out there a couple of days ago, yeah. and uh, so it's uh, uh, it's an exciting place to do it. And uh, you know what a, a what a great setting. We think we have a nice variety of shows this year. Anything from uh, you know Willie Nelson coming out, which will be kind of the big show for the summer, and uh, two cellos. So we'll have someone up on stage playing uh, classic rock and uh, and classic music uh, with the same instruments. And uh, so it's a nice. Nice variety, and again, we really appreciate that we get to work so closely with parks in the city to uh, uh, take advantage of this wonderful opportunity out there. That was my next question for you, and we have our uh, city engineer represented over here. So, uh, well, how will how would one get to Pinewood Bowl this summer? This summer, there'll be um, as in what you're referring to is the uh, roundabout that'll happen at Coddington out there, and. Um, We've been able to work already with the uh, general contractor and with the city and look at some of our opportunities. So uh, on the website, we'll have alternate ways to get in, uh, but the, uh, the construction will happen in four phases. And there is a sense that there will be at least one lane going through, um, uh, out to the bowl through most of the summer. Uh, what we'll suggest to people is to travel down either West A or even better West O out to West 40th and then down and come in from the West. Um, that's an ideal way and it actually uh, it, it feeds into the bowl quite nicely. Uh, some of the exit capacity will either be back out onto um, uh, through the uh, through what we would call the Elk Gate or through the Bison Gate back onto Coddington. And uh, we've worked closely with uh, the park uh, guys, Matt, and everyone else out there as far as how we do traffic. And uh, we'll constantly update people. There'll be some articles in the paper about it, plus uh, a lot of information on our website, uh, uh, Pinnacle, or excuse me, pinewoodtheater.com. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Tom? I move approval of item 23. Tom. Oh, excuse me. Oh, wait, just oh, see, does anyone else, would anyone else like to testify on th these items? Thanks. I move approval of item 11 through 23. Oh, she's coming forward. Yeah. Okay. Let's. <coughs> Jane Kinsey with uh, Watchdogs of Lincoln Government. Um, we would support any income that SMG and P the Pinnacle Bank Arena can add to their financial deficit, which. Um, which can erase part of the financial de deficit of the city and the West Haymarket JPA, which we find deplorable at the amount of about a million dollars. Would anyone else like to speak to this item? All right. Now, I will move approval of items 11 through 23. Second. Moved by Roy and second by Trent. Discussion? Please call the roll. Fellers? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried mm -hmm. 7 to 0. 
Next then are our public hearing resolutions. Item 24 is approving Endgame Operating Group LLC doing business as Big Red Restaurant and Sports Bar as a Kino satellite site at 8933 <coughs> Andermatt Drive. Bill Harvey uh, and our location address is 8933 Andermatt Drive and we um, are here at, with a Kino satellite application. So basically this location will be a satellite location of our other location on West O Street. The numbers will be drawn on, on West O Street and just like with any other satellite in Lincoln will be transmitted to this location. Thank you. Any other questions from the council? Very efficient of you today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to this item? All right, please call the next time, Teresa. All right, next is item 25, accepting the report of new and pending claims against the city and approving disposition of claims set forth for the period of April 1st through the 15th, 2017. Would anyone like to come forward to speak to a claim? All right, please call the next item, Teresa. All right, next then is item 26, approving an interlocal agreement between the city and Lancaster County on behalf of Lancaster County Corrections Community Service Program to conduct roadside litter pickup along county roads by inmates and to provide supervision of the inmates for a term of May 1st, 2017 through December 31st, 2017. Hi, Judy Halstead, Lincoln Lancaster County Health Department. Mm -hmm. um, here to bring the city county interlocal agreement to you. Um, this is one, as according to my records, I think it's the 13th year that we have utilized the um, litter reduction recycling grant funds to uh, award $5,000 to Lancaster County Corrections. Um, many of you will remember these are individuals who are in county corrections for um, short periods of time. They have to earn the privilege to be participating in the roadside cleanup. Uh, generally, they're there for um, crimes such as writing bad checks or not paying child support, um, but they are supervised. And what our grant funds go towards is um, helping to offset some of the cost of the supervision of the inmates out doing this work. And um, they typically have been the group that has done more than any other. Uh, and they continue to be great partners with us in this effort. And so we appreciate that. We don't have a lot of, of groups that often do the county roads and they take care of some of the county roads for us. Be happy to answer any questions that you have. Cindy. Um, can you tell me the source of the grant funds? Sure, it's the Nebraska, it's Nebraska Department of uh, Environmental Qualities, Litter <coughs> Reduction and Recycling Funds. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Judy? Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to this item? All right, seeing none, please call the next item. All right, next is item 27, approving an interlocal agreement between the city and the UNL Board of Regents to provide, maintain, and update online food handler training programs as federal, state, and local laws, regulations, and guidelines change. Thank you again, Judy Halstead, Lincoln Lancaster County Health Department. Um, a few weeks ago, Scott Holmes brought an interlocal agreement to you between the city and UNL to do the actual hosting site for our online food handler and our responsible um, beverage server uh, permits. And so this is actually for us to contract with them for the content changes. So as we've made changes to the content of the training, either city law has changed or um, a regulation or standard has changed in the food handler industry, we have um, we are under contract with them to actually make those online changes for us. So again, they've been a wonderful partner with us since we went online, I believe it was in 2009, and they continue to update that for us regularly through these funds. It is a two-year agreement um, and uh, with an opportunity to extend that if both parties agree. Cindy. Thank you. First, I want to thank you for your uh, making yourself available when I was looking for this particular site for someone. <laughs> no so problem. I appreciate that very much. Um, and as I understand it, the whole project is funded by the user fees. It is. That is correct. Okay. So there's no cost to the city. That is correct. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to this item? Well, don't go away too quickly, <laughs> Judy, because. We just want to recognize you in your service. This is your last time testifying before us in your current capacity as health director for the city and county, and we're, we're going to miss you. Thank you. Um, you've had such impeccable work uh, and done so much to promote and protect the health of Lincoln and Lancaster County. And 
Uh, we're very sorry to see you go. Feel free to come back and testify on things in Hecla's <laughs> as a citizen. I'll be here um, for open mic now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yeah. <laughs> I joined Trent. I just want to thank each of you because each of you have been very supportive of the health department and the work that we have done. Um, and, and I really appreciate each one of you for your individual support to me and to the department because um, all of you have helped to make us a better department. Uh, we hope that we have represented you well in your policies and I just want to be able to thank you for your service as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. All right, I think that takes us to the end of the public hearing for resolutions, Teresa. All right, next are our public hearing ordinances second reading and related resolutions. Item 28 is amending Title II of the Lincoln Municipal Code relating to establishing an appropriate funding level for the city's police and fire pension plans. Good afternoon, Council. Doug McDaniel, Human Resources, and with me is Paul Lutomsky, Pension Officer for the Police and Fire Pension. Uh, this uh, ordinance change uh, that we're proposing uh, uh, updates the funding policy for the police and fire pension. Uh, we've given you some information uh, in pre-council last week, uh, reminding you that this comes from a recommendation from the Citizens Pension Review Committee that was uh, held last year, and we bring this forward now. Paul Lutomsky will give you uh, briefly some of the historical information and some of the uh, detail that comes up to this point. Paul. Also, Ed, we have our uh, actuaries present as well uh, if you have questions of our actuaries. Okay. City clerk is handing out, oh, oh, my name is Paul Lutomsky in the city of Lincoln, uh, police and fire pension officer. City clerk just handed out Appendix B that you have in your packets already, but this one, just in case, has some language highlighted in yellow that I'll refer to. And Paul, could you bring the microphone a little closer to you? It's hard to hear. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the other handout is basically my presentation of uh, the history that Doug spoke about on the funding policy, um, the origin. Uh, of the policy really uh, comes from a citizen committee report issued May 2016. Can I just interrupt you for a second? Sorry, did you say there's another handout with the history? Because we have a Appendix B. On the last page of the oh, okay. yeah, Sorry. Thank you. I'm just trying to make a guess, I'm sorry. Keeping us on our toes. <laughs> Thank you. The piece of paper that I'm going to work off of is uh, headed with Lincoln City Council, uh, Monday, May 1, 3 p.m., agenda 28, number 1756, and has a next line down that says origin, uh, back to the citizen committee report uh, that was, citizen committee began in fall of 2015. They uh, did a comprehensive review of the pension plan, issued their report in May 2016, and their recommendation number two is listed below, which regards the funding policy that we're uh, looking at today. It says uh, the city should establish a funding policy that follows objectives and recommendations consistent with the Government Finance Officers Association and the actuarial community. Funding should be at the greater of the ARC, which is an acronym, that stands for actuarially recommended contribution or normal cost. Normal cost is a term that is used uh, to represent the cost of the pension plan for the coming year, assuming that uh, everything goes according to plan. Um, to continue, says the policy should include amortization periods for future unfunded liabilities that do not exceed 20 years. So as a result of that, the uh, city worked with the plan's actuary consulting firm, which is Kavanaugh McDonald, and they um, report to the council every year with their annual report. 
Uh, we work with them to develop a funding policy that met the city's objectives. Uh, so this isn't a policy that they developed in the vacuum. This policy was uh, developed in conjunction with them and the city to meet the city's objectives. Uh, just as by way of their credentials, Kavanaugh is the actuarial consultant also for the city of Omaha civilian uh, and the police and fire pension plans, and they are the consultant for all of the state of Nebraska defined benefit plans. Uh, policy before you is a best practice document that takes into consideration advice on pension fund funding uh, from the Conference of Consulting Actuaries, their industry standards, uh, and the Government Finance Officers Association. So some acronyms that will occur that I want to get out of the way first. Um, there's something called UAL, which you've heard before, or UAAL. Uh, both of these things refer to the unfunded accrued liability. And just as a, a refresher, uh, that is about a $50 million uh, un unfunded accrued liability. The plan is 80% funded right now. The other acronym is uh, kind of a, the ARC, the ARC, that was referred to by the Citizen Committee. Uh, that terminology uh, has since then been replaced by basically something that means the same thing, uh, but they're calling it ADEC for Actuarially Determined Employer Contribution, more of a generic term rather than a Basically, the ARC was a GASB-derived term, Government Accounting Standards Board, so they updated their terms there. So the funding policy uh, is the first handout that, that was given to you, and it's three pages long. Um, it, but before I get into this, I, I kind of like to say it's really kind of in three sections. Uh, we're 80% funded right now as a pension plan. So between 80% and 100% is section one. Between 100% and 110% is section two. And then everything at 100% and 10% or above, I'm gonna kind of segment into the third section on how things are funded. So regarding that first piece, uh, let's refer to the bottom of appendix B, page one. There's some language that's highlighted in yellow there. This describes what happens when the pension is less than 100% funded, in other words, right now. The language says, the actuarially determined employer contribution rate shall be the greater of the employer normal cost rate or the sum of the employer normal cost rate and the UAL contribution rate. That is kind of a more detailed, more descriptive way of saying what the um, citizen committee said in that the, they recommend the city should put in the greater of normal cost or the ARC, the, the ARC rate. So, so what, that, what that language means is that from the current 80% until 100% funding level, the city contribution shall be the ADEC rate, what was formerly known as the ARC. Second phase of the funding policy uh, asks you to refer to, to uh, page three, second paragraph, <coughs> and this is, describes what happens when 100% funding is attained. It says, uh, if the valuation, which is <coughs> uh, terms for the actuary report, if the valuation shows a surplus, in other words, a funded ratio that is above 100%, uh, the prior amortization bases, all those unfunded amounts, those prior bases will be eliminated and one base equal to the surplus will be established. Uh, the amortization <coughs> period of a surplus shall be a 20-year open period. So what we're doing there is saying that when we get at 100%, uh, the city contribution shall be normal cost only because there isn't an unfunded accrued liability anymore. Uh, that 
even though there is a surplus, because we're probably not going to be exactly 100%, um, that surplus isn't going to be used at that time to reduce the city's contribution. So at 100%, the city will contribute normal cost. It's only till we get to phase three that we, we look at reducing uh, normal cost a little bit less. So phase three um, is described, there's some language at the bottom of appendix B, page one. Uh, this says what happens when we get to 110%. That 110% needs to be attained for three years in a row. Um, it says a negative amortization payment shall only be applied if the plan has been at least 110% funded for the current and prior two years. So this basically, it means that <coughs> the city's contribution at that point shall be normal cost less an, an amount equal to the surplus uh, amortized over 20 years. So it's basically like getting a credit. We're gonna put in a little bit less than normal cost once we get to 110% and have been there for three years. Um, there's notes here that uh, this will only occur if the plan sustains the 110% funding level for three years. So let's say at some point we get to 110, we put in a little bit less than normal cost. Next year, the, the plan funding is measured in 109%. So now, now the, the different rules go into effect. Well, we're now we're putting in full normal cost again and then we have to get to 110% for three years in a row before the city starts taking credit uh, uh, for the excess funding and amortizing that over a 20 year period. So the 110% is, is basically is, is seen as a cap uh, that is uh, to be hovered around should that level get there. Um, that would be the end of my discussions, if there's any questions. In summary, before we get to questions, we would just add that we think this is a very responsible um, policy to move us forward. Um, this is funding for the current benefits for the men and women that we have hired today that we've pledged these benefits to. So we, we feel that this is a, a very responsible position that moves us forward from the previous policy that we had. But again, Paul and I are here to answer questions as are our actuaries as well. Okay, Roy, then Cindy, um, and then John. So we've got these two different amounts, the normal cost and the, AR, the ARC, or what's the new term? ADEC. ADEC, yeah. I'll try to remember that. So we've got the ADEC and the normal cost. For this year, did we contribute the higher of those two? For this coming budget year, we are contributing an amount that is between those two. Uh, we are seeking uh, to contribute at the higher amount. Right now, I, I think it's scheduled at 7.9 million. I believe that's correct. And the higher amount would require 8.1 million. So the difference is $200,000 difference? Correct. Okay, is that, would you say that's typical? Looking back, historically, if we're looking back and if we've been doing this for years, would that I, be typical? I would say that it's, I don't want to say typical, but I would say that when, when you're doing a, a projection of this magnitude, you're not going to be exactly right, so there's going to be some adjustment from year to year. Okay. 200,000 isn't, um, I guess, a, an unreasonable amount to have as a year-to-year as -year adjustment based upon um, how the uh, actuarial <coughs> value of assets changes on a market value basis compared to the 7.5% return assumption that these uh, projections are based upon. So if, if the assets do better than seven and a half, uh, next year's ADEC number will be lower than what we're currently projecting for it. 
if, if the returns are less than seven and a half, then next year's number are going to be a little bit higher than what are currently projected because the projected numbers assume a seven and a half percent return rate. Before we move to Cindy, can you just clarify which fiscal year you're talking about? Is it 17 I'm talking 18? about 17 18. Okay, thank you. Cindy? Uh, yeah, I'll defer to John first. That's I was pointing to John when you called on me. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Appreciate your presentation. I um, do have the budget per, uh, requests for the five year period if you'd like to see those. Okay. A couple of questions. Um, where you're under 100%, uh, and because we started this declining amortization of past service liability or whatever terms you want to use there. But uh, uh, two years ago, it was a 30-year, and then we're now stepping it down year by year. So this year will be a 28-year amortization. Correct. Will that continue to be stepped down each year? Yes. So what happens when that, let's theoretically say, the assumptions are pretty much on and the investments and so forth, the investments match the assumptions, you get down to zero. Um, when we get down to zero, that means we would be 100% funded. That means we would, the city would just contribute normal cost. Okay. What about new members that come on that have some slight past service because they don't enter the plan on the date of employment, but usually you do it at their entry age normal? Yeah. Oh, like if, if they come on, we, we do the valuation in you know, August 31 of every year. If they come on in January, then... The, the seven months in. of service that they've provided by August 31 would um, be included in the 831 valuation. So that would be at the current years of amortization. It wouldn't go to 30 years. It would be at like 28 or? Um, the, the current $50 million that I mentioned originally, that one is a tranche, if you will, that is going to be amortized down over 28, 27, 26, gradually down to zero. Any new year-to-year -year differences will be considered as their own individual yearly tranche. So with this policy, um, if there is a difference that occurs in fiscal years 16, 17 from what was expected, that year's difference be it surplus or not, uh, will be amortized over a separate 20-year tranche. So we're going to have the, the original 50 million decreasing over the next 28 years, but then each subsequent year will have its own individual tranche, and those individual tranches will be amortized over a 20-year period. What's a synonym for tranche, and how do you spell tranche? I, I don't know. Uh, just a, <laughs> a, a, a bucket, an accounting bucket, a year's worth of segment. experience. Segment. 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 Okay, I just want to make sure we and our listeners, viewers, are on the same wavelength. Um, we did the, service. we had a change this year with the, um, what had been that, uh, 13th check pool, and that Correct. had 25, 26 million dollars. We took the constraints off of it, and that's what allowed us to go from 100 plus million deficit or unfunded liability to about, I think it's really 54 million. Oh, yes, you're right. Yeah. So 54 million. Uh, but we still maintain that we're going to pay those 13th checks under that formula. Yes. What does that do to the funding? Um, well, it did a couple things. Um, there was approximately $27 million in the separate 13th check pool. That $27 million was added to the base benefits. Um, the amount of liability, as you said, to make the future 13th check payments uh, was, did not eat up the entire $27 million. It was approximately half of that amount. So one thing it did was add to the funding, the positive funding of the pension by the tune of about $13 million. The second thing it did was to eliminate the practice of having to contribute new money when the, when the market values returns were above 7.5% to the 13th check fund. 
So uh, you'll probably remember we were able to revert back to the 7.5% return rate that was used before uh, the adjustment was made to accommodate for the, the skimming or the sharing money into the 13 check fund. And that, that reversion from 6.75% as an assumed rate to 7.5% as an assumed rate for the entire pension plan, plan assets, uh, all of those things in combination are what uh, made the changes, as you said, from $103 million uh, to $54 million underfunded. So, okay. so with the uh, raising to the 7.5% investment return assumption or interest assumption in the plan, and let's say this next year you're, you're assuming that 7.5%, but it comes in at 5%. So you've got a couple hundred million dollars that you're trying to earn that on. So that's okay. going to be 4 or $5 million or more lower than you wanted it. Did I understand you correctly to say that 4 or $5, let's, let's say $5 million deficit just for clarity. Do we put that into its separate 20-year segment? Yes. Tranche, whatever word. <coughs> uh, yes, and in fact, um, there's a little bit more detail to that because uh, as the council <coughs> knows, uh, we use a, a five-year smoothing method. <coughs> so there will be the five-year smoothing that will mitigate the, or, or I should say, make the recognition of that uh, amount a more gradual aspect. Um, so uh, there'll be a tranche or a segment, but that tranche in the first year will only be a fifth of the difference. And then next year's tranche will recognize another fifth. So we'll start new five-year smoothings for each of those tranches? Yes. Just just like now, we have a five-year smoothing, and we compare um, the the actual experience with the actuarially expected experience. The difference between those two experience amounts is what would go into the the tranche or the segment that would be amortized over 20 years. So when you get to the bottom line here. Uh, we had a number of recommendations from the Pension Review Committee that uh, Trent had chaired, and I guess there are two things out of that that are two-part question here. One is, why didn't we bring forward some of the other recommendations? And secondly, by only bringing this recommendation forward and the way it's structured, are we not giving up a lot of flexibility? <coughs> the or maybe I make two separate questions. One, why didn't we bring the others' recommendations forward, or some of them anyway? And secondly, does this funding policy take away a lot of the flexibility that the city previously had in making contributions? I think to, to bring some of those other recommendations forward require negotiations with the unions impacted. A lot of those were regarding benefits, uh, and, and those all require, those are mandatory subjects of bargaining. So those have to be accomplished at the negotiations table before they can be brought to council. Uh, and, and so those are some, some of the reasons there. Your second question, John, does it take away some of the flexibility? Um, <coughs> in part, maybe it does, um, and, and maybe it should, uh, because as I said earlier, these are the benefits that we've already pledged to these employees, and they should be funded first because that's what our commitment and obligation is, not with those dollars that we have left should we then put into the pension. But first and foremost, this is what we pledge to our employees, and this is what we should do in terms of our fiscal you know, management of this pension plan. So as I said earlier, these are the benefits we pledge for these employees who are working today that need to be funded. So. Well, I appreciate that statement. I really like that carb and granite because I think I've been professing that for 16 or 18 years. So I'm glad to see that. I am concerned that a degree of flexibility would be taken away if we really had a challenging investment climate or economic downturn. Uh, but let's say we do have a bad downturn. We have this policy. We now put this ahead in the priority list, which it should be. Is the administration pledging to then look elsewhere to make cuts to meet those economic challenges? 
Well, before I answer for the administration, I'll first say that um, keep in mind that if we have a downturn, as Paul indicated, we have a five-year smoothing approach. So any sort of downturn would be mitigated by that five-year smoothing. We wouldn't feel the full impact in one year. Right? But we understand what you're saying. I'll defer to Mr. Hoppe, but I think by, by bringing this policy forward from this administration, this administration is committed to funding this pension plan to the best of our ability. Yet there's also a tremendous needs throughout all the infrastructure for funding. So it's the competition for the tax dollar. And I think we're doing our very best to make sure that we take care of our employees in this, with this benefit. I agree with that statement. I just have a, a concern that this could be used down the road if there's some economic challenges. And a 7.5% investment return is, is fairly strong in this current climate, but that that could be used as a way to say, well, we've got to raise taxes without being taking some prudent fiscal management. Well, and that's probably more of a Yeah, I'm not here to speak about taxes. I'm here to speak about funding a pension plan for our employees. So I guess I'll defer to, you know, mayor's office on that or any other, you know, entity. But my goal is to do our very best to fund this pension plan as I've said, and I'm repeating myself. This is an obligation we've made to our employees. When we hire them, we say, "Here's what your benefits will be." And here's what our obligation is as the city to fund that. So, and I, th I think we as yeah. elected officials have abrogated that responsibility in past years because it seemed like everything else, the budget was balanced and what was left went into the pension plan. And as a result, we, along with economic downturns, have created this challenge. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Trent. <coughs> so I, I served on that pension committee and I was pleased that you guys supported uh, those efforts with providing us knowledge. Um, <coughs> One of the things that stuck out to me in the pension report was that 19 out of the last 26 years, the city has failed to make its op obligation to the pension plan. Is that correct? Um, I believe so. That, that was in the pension report. And since 1990, the city has con contributed seven million, uh, approximately seven million less than the recommended contributions. And that has a pretty big ripple effect in funding this plan uh, over a period of time, correct? Correct. Uh, explain that a little bit. Um, well, let's say we have $7 million in the plan and we earn 5% on it. And that's, that's that much more money in the plan that won't be have have to be uh, contributed as tax dollars and that's that much more money that will be there next year to be compounded with next year's earnings so when we don't make our pension payment we borrow against that at a seven and a half percent interest rate over the over the amortization period correct correct okay um and i'm glad that there were uh, comments made on what the the changes that we have made uh, previously I think the 13th check move uh, really put this plan back on track and uh, and made it so that our our fiscal cliff of making that pension payment uh, was a little bit lighter um, do you remember what the pension payment would have been this year had we not made that change in excess of 12 million dollars so there's a six million dollar delta between what we paid this year and or four million dollar uh, delta million. i'm sorry yeah, i can't roughly do math four million yes sorry guys <laughs> um and these really are the only two changes right now that we could make legislatively other than going and negotiating with our public safety unions it's my recollection. I don't have all those recommendations in front of me. I wasn't prepared to address those, but yes, I mean, uh, we're looking at these, you know, systematically, and if there's other changes we can make, we will, but many of those need to be changed at the negotiations. Table. I guess we, we could have dropped, dropped the drop plan, uh, but that wouldn't have resulted in any significant savings. We didn't see that as a significant change. It was like maybe $600,000 over correct. a term of 30 years. That's correct. Um, is, any, is there anything else that we're missing with this ordinance, something that we would need to include? I don't believe so. I mean, we've, we've talked about this, and we've looked at it, and we've made many changes. Again, we've uh, invoked the advice of our actuaries who, who do this professionally. Uh, um, we, we, we've listened to citizens who've given input. Uh, we've, 
We've discussed it amongst ourselves with finances. We've discussed it with you. We've discussed it with the unions. Uh, so I think we've covered things to the best of our ability. Uh, we, we think it's, it's a step that moves us in the right direction uh, for what we have today in terms of a plan design. And having an actuarially determined contribution uh, is nothing that's out of the ordinary. Uh, if you go and look at the pension report, Exhibit 7, page 1, I mean, there's at least five or six plans that are on here that include actuarially determined uh, pension plans. So that's not, that's something that's not out of the ordinary for that's a city correct. of our size. All right. Thank you. Um, I know Trent had mentioned some of the other possibilities or recommendations from the Pension Review Committee. So, for example, if we wanted to raise the retirement age, is that uh, an item that was recommended in the Pension Review Report? Is that subject to the union negotiations? Yes, it is. Okay. Cindy. Thank you. Um, I just want to follow up a little bit on what um, Councilman Camp was talking about because the the first thought that occurred to me is what would have happened when we had the economic downturn of 2008 what would have happened in the years following that with regard to the pension plan had we had this ordinance in place have you contemplated that or could you explain Paul I'll first speak to the sensitivity analysis a little bit maybe if you're the, going to the five-year smoothing would have taken into effect uh, so the losses that were incurred in the 2008 um, would have been recognized gradually over the course of the next five years um, if this plan were to have been in effect at that time. Um, every year when 20% of those losses were recognized, they would have been then put on an amortization schedule to be paid off over the coming 20 years. Um, I think the uh, financial impact, um, and, and of course, you know, we, we changed the amortization period um, to be the maximum um, back then of 30 years open. Um, there would be slightly more pressure for the city to contribute at, the, at a slightly higher um, amount than what happened. And that was part of the criticism, uh, really, of the Citizen Review Committee was that the, the city uh, should have put in a little bit more and acted a little bit sooner after the 2008 <coughs> occurrence. So if that happens again, I think uh, any kind of criticism in that regard would be mitigated by this policy. In the report that um, Councilman Fellers was talking about, where 19 out of 26 years it wasn't, uh, we didn't meet our obligation. And my understanding is that all but eight of those years it was 100% funded. Do you know which years that it wasn't? Uh, I have a handout. Let's see. I'll have enough copies. Keep a copy for Doug mm -hmm. and I. I have a copy. Um, what's being distributed now is a, a handout with valuation data of a detailed nature from 1991 up through 2016. Um, I'm sorry. It's a handout that has detailed uh, valuation data from 1991 through 2016. I would have to go through and add things up, but it definitely has all the answers to your questions on there. You can see the evaluation date is the first column. The funded status is the next column. So in 1991, for example, the plan was 116% funded. Gotcha. Uh, it looks like it maxed out at 128. There's a, a liability amount, a asset amount, and the next column is an unfunded amount. Um, assumed rate of return, market rate. The last two columns, I think, speak to what your question is in, in terms of the employer contributions that are uh, actuarially recommended versus the money that was actually contributed. 
Okay, and then it looks like from this, I'm looking at the left-hand column, the valuation dates, um, August 31st, always the end of the fiscal, and it looks like it was pretty pretty much 95 to 100% up until 2010. Well, and that's that's the five years smoothing kicking in. Right, um, and so yeah. is does do these figures, would I be right that these, the figures, uh, 2009 or 2010 um, right through 2016 in fact these or at least those first few years are what would have would answer my question of what would have happened if this were in place in 2000 uh, and when we saw the economic downturn of 2018 well then you'd have to compare um, I mean, it's 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 kind of like actually comparing apples to oranges because this the 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 way that the actuarial employer contributions were calculated on this piece of paper are not uh, one as strong as what this funding policy would say should be calculated. Um, in 2008, as we discussed, the amortization period was changed to 30 years and it was a 30 year open period until 2016. So the numbers that you're seeing here uh, they, we, we take the, the unfunded accrued liability and amortize them over 30 years. And then next year we, we start over again at 30 years and again until we get to 2016. And then we decided we needed to take more affirmative action on this. I so so this, this gives you a, a guideline, but I, I think I would have to defer and, and say that if you really want um, a, a accurate... Uh, depiction of what the funding pressures would have been as of some date forward under the new policy. I think we'd have to do a study and give you it, that answer that is way. Is it fair to say that the actuarial uh, recommendations that are listed in the next last column would have been greater under this current policy that's firm? So. Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. Um, yes. and then I just had a couple just kind of precise questions because that's what I do. So I'm looking at the um, ordinance and I'm looking at just some of the changes that are made. I'm on, um, I think, page one, yeah. Page one, line 15, and uh, clearly this was written some time ago and it talked about that the, um, the contribution would be placed in the pension fund no later than the end of the fiscal year in August 31st, 2012, which of course doesn't make sense for this. But I'm wondering, it just says now the end of the fiscal year. And so do we have a fiscal beginning? In other words, I kind of expect when I looked at it would say that, that by the end of each fiscal year beginning fiscal year 2018 or something of that nature or beginning in August 31st, 2018. So is there in, any beginning date? Did I just miss that or is that is that in here somewhere and I'm just not seeing it because I'm looking at this section? You didn't miss anything. Okay. And the 2012 data, I mean, th that date is an old date and that's why sure. it was taken out. The idea is that by the end of the fiscal year. So if this passes, um, the end of the fiscal year that we're talking about will be the end of the, uh, this, this current fiscal year. The end of 1718? Uh, well, we're, well, well, we're now in 1617. <laughs> We want. I mean, we might just want to make that more clear for our, ourselves. Maybe even um, certainly can. Yeah. So my understanding is that this that the contribution will be made no later than the August thirty first of the fiscal year in question. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. And so maybe we can uh, talk about that between now and a voting session. Can. Yep. Okay. My my second question um, was having to do with the line beginning at, at number 11, pay, I'm sorry, line 11, uh, the annual contribution determined pursuant to the funding policy detailed. And then, um, I'm sorry, that's not what I was looking at at all. I apologize. Page two, line two and three. As I read that, I knew that wasn't what I was looking at. 
the page two, line two and three, it does change the language of what the computation shall be, and it says um, instead of the table in 1971, it says um, actuarial assumed earnings rate. Can you tell me what impact that difference has on the ordinance? This was changed because the funding policy and uh, as as you experienced some some mortality tables uh, get reviewed when the pension plan works with its actuary and does an experience study once every five years and the, so that was based on mortality tables yeah back the, in the 1971 table is outdated uh, we're currently using a, a year 2000 table and then the, the assumed, the, the interest rate of 6%, that was eliminated to defer to the, the policy 7.5%. Uh, okay, and wasn't that changed at some point in the recent past? Yes, and we did an experience study, and I think that was two years ago. We did the experience study, or was it just last year? I've lost track of time, Paul. Um, but yes, the... There uh, were implications of the plan funding at that point. You are correct. Okay, and, and what, on what basis does that get changed? Uh, once every five years, uh, we work with the actuary to do something called an experience study, where they compare our actual experience to the assumptions that they have in place. And they say, well, okay, well, this assumption is correct. Maybe this one needs to be updated. And one of the things that was updated in the 2014 experience study was the mortality table it was actually changed I believe well I've got a li I've got it listed here um, before it was uh, the uh, well, okay and f until uh, the, the 1971 group mortality table became effective August 31st um, on 8 31 16 uh, <clears throat> a study was done so that we use the 1971 group mortality table projected to 2000, set back zero years for men, five for women. In 831.13, uh, the mortality table was changed again to, a, to be the 1994 group mortality table set forward two years for men, one for females. On 831.14, the mortality table was changed to be uh, a table called RP2000 with a generational mortality improvement using scale double A. So you can see by having it written in the ordinance is, is not uh, a good idea in terms of allowing the flexibility that's necessary to, to make changes to. So we're going to go with a more current mortality table, whatever is the most current yeah. at any given time. Not, not actually. Uh, sorry, but not, not the most current, um, but the most appropriate for use with our demographic. Okay. And then the assumed earnings, is, did this, does this body have the authority to change what we want to assume as earnings? Uh, not to my knowledge. That uh, is something that the plan administrator has control over, and it isn't as if the plan administrator um, in a vacuum, once again, sets that kind of number. Um, we work with a professional investment advisor who looks at our portfolio every year and actually in May they're going to do another evaluation, an asset allocation study where they're going to, to evaluate uh, kind of like the actuary, if, if the numbers are working out as we expected, and if not, perhaps make some changes. And then based upon uh, the asset allocation to equities and stocks and, and bonds and uh, our different asset classes and the probabilities of achieving X returns within those asset classes, uh, they will uh, tell us what a reasonable 20-year long-term uh, return expectation would be, and that's where the seven and a half comes from, and we look at that every year to, to see if that's valid or not. Thank you very much.
Jane. Um, I just have a, a question for you on the, the recent handout. I quickly tallied up all the uh, funded status, the percentage that we're funding our obligation, and it seems like 19 out of the 26 years shows that we the funding ratio was actually at 95% or higher. And then, so that means that seven of those years, it was below 95%, <coughs> um, with the lowest happening in 2015 at 64%. And that's when we made the decision to, to merge that 13th paycheck. Mm -hmm. So how do, how do we compare as a, a municipality to other, other jurisdictions in terms of the ratios that we have been funding historically since 1991? I, I don't know that I'm capable of answering that, Jane. You know, our actuaries might be, but again, if you're asking how we compare it to funding status of other municipalities, um, you know, that would probably engage a, a fairly lengthy study and, and such to say how are they funded. Uh, I think we're going in the right direction. Uh, we're not where we'd like to be, uh, but you can say, well, Detroit is, you know, 20 percent, Omaha is maybe 60 or 70 percent uh, after some changes and things like that. But our actuaries would have a more accurate count on that. But again, it's not necessarily apples to apples because you may be talking school districts, you may be talking state, you may be talking different municipalities and such and different plan designs. Um, we have to focus on what we're doing and, you know, our goal is to be at 100 percent or higher, you know, and, and moving forward. So. Uh, I don't think any of us are necessarily pleased that for those five years we were below 100%, but I think we want to take every step possible to move it higher. I, I think I could use our former colleague, Councilman Cook, who made this statement, Lincoln is bleeding, but not bleeding as much as other jurisdictions, and that'll save you a lot of fees. Well, I, I think, actually, that Omaha ha is funded only at 52%. Yeah, I mean, I... And so I... I can't keep track of each municipality, to be honest, and I just want to make sure that we're doing everything we can with ours. So, And I would probably ask the, our actuaries that are here present, because, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, you might be able to answer this, but certainly um, when we get our AAA bond rating, I'm guessing that they may look at our pension liability and the unfunded liability and our funding ratios that we I currently don't, have. Don't guess. No, oh, don't guess. <laughs> under the new Gatsby they rules, they absolutely do. Yep. Yes. Okay. It, under the new Gatsby rules, it absolutely impacts our balance sheet and our, and our bond rating. So, okay. Carl. Thank you. Um, and thanks, Paul, for this last sheet that you handed out. Um, I'm not an actuarial, <laughs> so I won't want to ask some questions here. I'm, I'm looking at the last column, the last two columns, uh, the employer contributions. And so the actuarial column, would that be what, what would be recommended that the city put in or explain what that column means? Okay. The, the actuarial column is recommended. And in terms of timing is where things get, <clears throat> I guess you have to think a little bit um, so, for example, I mean, I'm looking at the last line, 831.16, it says actuarial $9.5 million. That $9.5 million was, and, and perhaps maybe this is uh, something that if I misspeak, Pat can, can help me out, but it's a number that was created uh, on the 831.16 valuation date uh, with the assumptions uh, in effect at that time. So I, I guess I'd have to have to look at that. Well, I don't know, Pat, can you help me out with this? Explaining the, the date question. I mean, what we're doing right now is using the 816 valuation to set the 17, 18 payroll numbers. I hate to so put you on the spot okay. like this. What's the question? <laughs> Can you explain the, the source of these numbers and how they're used is the question. Could you just mention your name and address, please? Thank you. Certainly. 
Uh, Patrice Beckham, Kavanaugh McDonald, uh, 3906 Rainer Parkway, Bellevue, Nebraska. Uh, actuary for the, the city. Um, the actuarial contribution rate is, in fact, the probably what you're used to hearing as the recommended contribution. It's, it's essentially based on the funding policy that was in place at that point in time. Uh, what Paul's kind of alluding to is, in, in real time, there has to be a lag between the valuation date and the budgeted amount because it takes time to do the valuation and you're not going to change a budget in the current year. So there is a projection from the valuation to the date the money is expected to be contributed to come up with that dollar amount. But I think in this very simplistic viewpoint, actuarial is based on your funding policy how much should go in, how much should be contributed. And the column to the right is, of course, the actual dollars that went in for each of those fiscal years. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. And, and so uh, I guess just in observations then of, of where the actual match up with, with the actuarial, um, the 18 or 19 of the 26 years, uh, we, the city actually put in less than what was recommended. And that, uh, that decision over time uh, has, has resulted in the you know, significant increase of, of, of what is owed or, or why we're behind in, in our funding of the whole pension. Um, certainly to the extent contributions have not gone in, the funding of the system is affected, but I wouldn't underestimate the impact of the financial crisis, which is still relatively recent in the history of the, the life of the plan, right. and the impact that that has had on funding and we're basically Correct. trying to okay. dig out of a hole over a 30-year period. It's just going to take a lot of time before that impact is, is negated by additional contributions. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Jane. This question is for Pat. Pat, um, since this is a best practice to, to implement something like what we're discussing today, how many of the other plans that you review and evaluate, do they have this type of formula in place? All of them or most of them, some of them, one of them? Um, most plans have a formal funding policy. Um, the few that do not are working on those as we speak. Um, the, the, so the policy is basically kind of the actuarial cost method, that entry normal that we've talked to you about before how the assets are going to be calculated for evaluation purposes, which reflects that asset smoothing method that Paul talked about, and then the amortization policy. And the, the first two are pretty common among other public plans. Very, you know, what you're using is very standard. Amortization policy varies by system because there's a lot of variance in the funded ratios of systems um, and the budget situation for different entities. Um, what you're doing, though, with the, as Paul calls them, the tranches, I call them layers because I'm not that fancy. Um, but that approach is becoming very popular because it does away with that cliff at the end of the amortization period. So it's going to kind of mitigate the paying a, a high contribution and having it drop to nothing because all that experience in the next 28 years for you guys will be set up over new bases that are amortized and spread out over a longer period of time. So that's becoming very common for public plans. The recommendation from the Conference of Consulting Actuaries who issued a white paper on best practices for pension, public pension plans and the GFOA also issued guidance. Um, and that shorter amortization period for the new pieces at 20 years is right in line with those recommendations. So I think you guys are very much mainstream um, following best practices and, you know, kind of putting that on record to do that. Thank you. Thank you. I actually have a question for you as well. You mentioned a lag time between when you do the actuarial recommended contribution and then what is actually put in our budget. Um, budgets are dynamic entities, they are moving targets, but to the extent that we could reduce that lag time, could we be better at doing our pension contribution? Do you have any recommendations for the city about how to reduce that lag time? Is there something that you see in other cities that would potentially help us here in Lincoln to help mitigate any inefficiency or 
um, to help increase the precision of our contribution? It's very, very common for there to be a lag. And, you know, Lincoln has a one-year lag. So we do the, the 831-16 valuation to set the contribution for 1718. That, that's the most common. Um, it's, it's very unusual to do a valuation. Remember, we won't have numbers to the city until the end of the year. So end of December, 1st of January. Um, so it's, it's pretty unusual to sort of do it in real time, to have some smaller utility plans that are able to, to do that. And if you wanted to, you could accelerate, reflect it in the current year. Um, but that is really not as common. I would say as long as you consistently put the money in, whether the subsequent valuation says more or less, if you always follow and put that amount in, over the long run, it, it works out. There isn't a bias one way or another. Where I've seen problems is where, you know, there's a number out there that says you should contribute $8 million and the next valuation says you only need $7, and, and then you go, oh, well, we'll just use the $7 million instead of the 8 If you don't follow that practice, I think you're fine. Thank you. And then, Doug, I had a question for you, because when the concern John raised about interest rate assumption and how <coughs> good it is, um, both in the pre-council we had and just I heard you say sensitivity analysis, is that what Paul was describing is when he was trying to explain the smoothing over five years? Is that part of the sensitivity analysis? Or is the sensitivity analysis another step you've taken to try to ensure that our assumption is as good as it can be? Thank you. Uh, the sensitivity analysis relates to the funding where we looked at what happens, what would be the worst case scenario if we didn't make our 7.5% and then what would be the best case scenario if we exceeded it. And we looked at that in terms of portions and so we could see what our liability looked like if we fell short and say, and I don't have the sensitivity analysis directly in front of me, but what happens if we made 6.5%? you know, what would our pension obligation be at that point? And our actuaries did that sensitivity analysis for us. Paul can probably speak to it in greater detail because this is what he loves to pour over at 10 o'clock at night when he can't sleep. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, I guess if you could just put in layman's term for us how it helps to have that done. It gave us the reassurance then and said basically what is our, what's our liability, you know, and what's our, and, and what is on the end of it, you know, if we exceed 7.5%, what's that look like? If you're asking... From, from a standpoint of the pension administrator, why we set 7.5%, you know, that's what we do with our investment advisor and looking at this in a long-term sense and saying how achievable is 7.5% over the long-term analysis. And that's, that's what we <coughs> go through internally to look at. Are we still being reasonable in terms of that? And again, it varies by municipality. Some municipalities have an 8% assumption rate. You know, some have 7 a quarter. You know, we have landed on seven and a half because our investment advisor has said that that's achievable if we make these sort of changes with our asset allocations. And I think we're on par for that. When you say these sorts of changes, does it mean the entire package of changes in the from the pension review committee or just no, no. these that we're the contemplating? Changes in terms of asset allocations, where we make our investments. Okay. All right. Okay. I did bring <clears throat> a sample of a sensitivity analysis. Out this I can save one for myself, of course. You can keep it and talk to it. Because uh, when they look I, at I it, I handed out a sample that that Thank was you. prepared by our actuaries that shows um, in yellow highlight there. What if instead of earning seven and a half percent in fiscal 2016, zero percent were earned? Uh, the column on the right is the difference. So this is an illustration of if we don't earn anything this fiscal year, how the demands would increase over the 25 years, because we take the, the money and spread it over a five-year smoothing period and then amortize each of those over a 20-year period. Could you walk us through what you want us to understand from this chart, since that might be helpful? Um, well, if 0% were earned on assets in 2016-17. Only, correct? Only. Okay. And after that, 7.5% were earned 
consistently based upon a comparison. Uh, there's, a, there's a baseline number, column nine, that says that that assumes seven and a half every year. Uh, the alternate is the column that says, what if we earn 0% in 1617? The difference column would be the amount of additional contributions that would be necessary in order to make up for that 0% in 1617. Uh, what I would give to you, what I want you to take away from this is the fact, and in, in layman's terms, is that um, we who are charged with coming up with policy and funding decisions to present to you have done our due diligence in looking at this very, very carefully and doing an analysis as to what would happen if we didn't make our projected earnings or what would happen if we exceeded our projected earnings. So again, for you and for us, it's a due diligence that says we've studied this very, very carefully to make sure that we're presenting you with the correct funding policy that is good for both our employees and for the city. Well, I don't want to speak for John, but I thought maybe his concern and one that I think we share is how, I mean, not that we would expect it to go to zero, but what if it's more realistically six? and. So I'm not sure how this analysis helps, other than I think it says that over the long term, between now and 2044, there'd be an extra 42 million that we would need to pay as a result of just having one year of no investment return. Is that what this chart says? So how does that address the maybe less severe change that, I mean, Th this is a, this, this is a scalable <coughs> number as I understand it. And so if zero percent results in these numbers, if we earn three and a or three point seven five percent instead of seven, we can take all of these numbers and divide them by two. That's just that, for one year. Right. Does that make sense? That's it's. it's so we don't have examples for every percentage, but it's a scalable amount. Would that apply to the 13th check fund, too, that we moved over, the projections you have on that at 7.5% forever? But you got that $13 million oh, these, yeah, the, the 13th check is now rolled into this sensitivity analysis, so yes. Would it be fair to say, if we look here in recent history, that 2009... As we've acknowledged, there was a change in the plan through the administration that went from a 10-year amortization of the past service liability, the unfunded liability, actuarial liability, to 30 years, which basically cut the contribution amount in half. It's, it's like a home mortgage. If you have a 10-year mortgage versus 30-year, if you looked at your monthly payment of principal and interest, the 10-year would probably be about twice what the 30-year is. So we did that in 2009, and so it's these numbers that we looked at on the first exhibit you handed out would have been dramatically worse if we hadn't done that. And then secondly, we went to an extra 25% smoothing from four to five years, so we also pushed out the uh, two years of investment declines. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, this last year, we absorbed the 13th check. That took, uh, these were cushions that we had in the plan, and we've removed the, the 10 year to 30 year amortization, or the 30 year to 10, 10 to 30, removed a huge cushion we have, and that's what I always worked with when I was establishing defined benefit plans. Doing the smoothing took further cushion out. Now the 13th check is an additional cushion, and finally going then to the mandated here, we, we've come from the ability for the city, should it need to, whether some challenges, it's, it's been drastically minimized. Now that doesn't take away, and I agree 100% with Mr. McDaniels, that the pension is one of our top priorities. I mean, period. It's, it's number one, and I've professed that during my whole career here on the council. And that's where we in the political environment have not met our obligations. We, we just didn't fund it where it should have been. But by making these three moves and now this fourth, we've taken out a lot of flexibility that does concern me that if we just really had a, a calamity, 
we are locking ourselves in and I, I think maybe it's I, I, as I evaluate this legislation I'm just I'm hesitating a little bit thinking that uh, you know in life we all we as human beings like to have some flexibility and so but I, I, I like to go on that schedule of what this legislation professes because I think that's the right thing to do it's just what if we have a unforeseen calamity we won't have the flexibility then certainly there's a <coughs> we, we've spoken about generational equity before and uh, while that doesn't really help with your how to handle a calamity and the flexibility it does kind of come into play in terms of what this policy addresses and best practices in that the people that are receiving the services um, pay for those same services. So if we you know, push the cost of today's services ahead, we're, we're getting further away from generational equity. I want to go back to my question. Sorry, and Doug, maybe you can help me with this. Um, if this, if the sensitivity analysis is supposed to help us address the question of what happens if the plan earns less than seven and a half percent, but the sensitivity analysis is zeroing it out for one year and going right back to seven point five percent, and every year after that, how is it useful? You said it's scalable, but how is it useful if, in fact, maybe the seven point five percent assumption is wrong, or is there? different analysis the actuary has done that gives you confidence that the 7.5% is right, in which case, why do this? Long term. That, you, you follow me? <laughs> he follows me. That's yeah, that, 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 that's actually a very good question. And uh, the answer is long term. Uh, that's what the 7.5% is designed to do, is to, to be a long term um, expectation. Uh, we're never going to be probably at seven and a half. We're going to be above it. We're going to be below it. Uh, and that's what this illustrates is that one year below, maybe next year it'll be above. Um, so the, the usefulness is, um, I think, there in terms of looking at the short-term impact or pressures that could come from earning less. Um, but as, as you said, if we expect 7.5% long term, we shouldn't really worry about the, the shorter term fluctuations. And then just to reiterate, it sounded like you said earlier that every, maybe it was in the pre-council or maybe it was today, that every five years the policy is reviewed for any necessary updates. Is that correct? On an actu actuarial basis, it's reviewed in terms of comparing the assumptions to experience on a we have a separate review with our financial advisor that occurs every year in terms of um, assessing if we're uh, holding or uh, working towards the, the optimal portfolio in terms of risk and return. But in terms of Section 5 funding policy review, in yeah. the Appendix B of what we are actually yep. holding public hearing on today, that um, is that refers to the experience study every right. uh, we used to do it every five okay so yes not but it says but not less frequently than every five years okay that's not the funding policy but the experience those assumptions we make to put into the plan yeah. such as the census tables what the rate of return should be um, so on and so forth. I think the idea is that when we do the the experience study, that'll be our cue to look at this uh, funding policy also. Well, that's what I was I wanted to confirm because it sounds like what it's saying is that this funding policy that we're discussing today is what will be also reviewed and amended as necessary by the plan administrator, not less frequently than every five years following Correct. the experience study. Okay, yes. so there's some room for. Tweaking it sounds like in the future, as needed. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank it's you. It's a it's a moving target. Any further questions from the council? Is everyone behind me fast asleep? Yes. 
Nobody's behind you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. What we live and breathe. Okay. All right, thank you very much. All right, this time I'd invite anyone else who'd like to speak to this item to come forward. Deb Andrews, 1235 A Street. I oppose the proposed ordinance to fund the police and fire pension plan at 110% as recommended by an actuarial firm. We can't afford it. Currently, the city falls short of funding basic services, park maintenance, snow removal, public transportation, street maintenance, to name a few. The city budget situation was so dire last year, the mayor sued the council to raise taxes. Perhaps whoever drafted this ordinance is unfamiliar with Lincoln's finances. The police and fire pension plan elevates those departments above other city employees who have a defined contribution plan. I want to put this on the... The income in Lincoln is up just 10% in 10 years. Poverty has increased 48% in those same 10 years. Our bonded indebtedness that we vote on is up 118%. The certificate of participation bonds that we don't have a vote on is up 2,000. 886% in 15 years. The city has been forced to borrow $42 million in COPS bonds to fund city services. From 1968 to 2015, Nebraska's population has increased 29%. While tax collections are up 643%, adjusted for inflation during that same period of time. Since 2010, 15 sanitary and improvement districts in Nebraska have filed for bankruptcy. Will that be our future? The spending course we are on is not sustainable. Many council members are aligned with the union. All unions are interconnected and they're international. 20 years ago, union leadership took the anti-communist clause out of the union constitution by unanimous vote. It is more transparent to describe those elected officials as aligned with the communist-led union. People sincerely concerned about safety need look no further than learning failure in schools. Just 40% of Nebraska students are proficient at reading. For blacks, just 22% score proficient at reading. How will they support themselves? In math, it's a little bit better. 46% of Nebraska students are proficient at math but just 12% of black students are proficient at math. There's nothing wrong with our students. The problem lies in curriculum and instruction. The teachers union is the largest in the nation. All ignore learning failure. Learning failure is union success. The system expands. The LPS curriculum director presiding over the largest number of failing schools in the state just had a school named for her. Your vote whether or not to support this ordinance to fund the pension at 110% as ordered by an actuary will inform Lincoln citizens who you represent, citizens or the communist-led union. For council members who support this ordinance, I recommend a book just published by the MIT Press. Communism for Kids, How Capitalism Makes People Suffer. The passage of this ordinance will accelerate Lincoln's trajectory of soaring debt and exploding poverty. And I have handouts. 
if you want to give each council member. Thank you. That's all. Would anyone else like to speak to this item? <coughs> you could come on forward. Thank you. Thank you. Jane Kinsey with Watchdogs of Lincoln Government. Uh, we support this um, ordinance with reservations and recommendations for improving it. Uh, according to the report uh, that was made about the pension fund, and I won't go over some that's already been said, but it's noted that since 1990, the city has contributed seven million less than the recommended contributions. The committee that studied this does not know for certain why, when the plan was fully funded or nearly funded, perhaps the elected officials felt they could contribute less than what was recommended. Certainly, it is a way to balance the city's budget in the short run. However, the reasons the city's pension contribution was, however, the reason, whatever the reasons, the city's pension contribution was shortchanged too often. The city does, none of this works. However, if the city does not make the recommended contributions year after year, if we can't afford it or we are unwilling to commit the resources to fund it property, properly, then the city's leaders must find a way to reduce the obligation. Not funding the city's obligation to the pension plan may also negatively impact, may also negatively impact the city's credit ratings, the city's credit ratings for the municipal bonds, a needed funding source for many pro, um, projects. And one thing all sides uh, agree, the city must fund its obligation, period. The standard expectation of a democratic government is safety obligation, and that is an established order to protect its citizens. Police and firefighters are on the front line to do this. And it is unconscionable not to support safety employees, and which also is supported by the public, the number one priority in Lincoln. The council to bring forth additional rev rev resolutions to this is that there be an addendum or some kind of reference that the city's leaders cannot play games with funding this. Um, as the um, committee pointed out, uh, they had the power to uh, do that in the past, which led to the problem that we have right now. So we would like to see um, some recommendation, some addition, amendment, some inclusion in this resolution that this could not happen in the future. And also, um, th this was discussed, 7.5% uh, is the consistent with the rate for many pension plans. So that's not out of line. However, uh, when people are dealing with um, obligations such as the stock market, they have to recognize that what goes up must come down in bull and bear markets. And so this must be addressed also in order to make sure that you don't uh, get in a hole. Prudent investors all have to do this, and it is no less the obligation of the city officials in Lincoln, Nebraska. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to this item? Okay, seeing none, please call the next item. 
All right, I'll call item 29, creating alley repaving district number 51 from 18th Street to Antelope Valley Parkway between O and N Streets. Hello, Randy Hoskins, Assistant City Engineer. Uh, Public Works has received a petition to create an alley paving district, um, as you see there, uh, between uh, O and N and uh, 18th and Antelope Valley. Basically, this would uh, repave about half an alley where we have some tranches, which uh, <laughs> is, is, a, is a combination of a pothole and a trench. Um, and so uh, this is uh, something. So we have potholes on our pension plan. <laughs> And with that, I've been pretty well for to answer any questions. <laughs> I think we need to change our vocabulary. <laughs> any questions? All right. Thank you. Right. Would anyone else like to speak to this item? Someone who's been very patient. <laughs> That's okay. You have serious matters before you. Robert Duncan, 4801 North 7th Street. Uh, uh, I'm a partner in Assemblage, which backs up to this alley. Uh, the alleys, uh, the, our portion of the alley is very old with bricks and, it, and it drainage is poor and uh, it just needs to be replaced. And I've talked to the, uh, the gentleman across the street from it. He's okay with that. In fact, I think, I believe that everyone is okay with it. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to this item? <coughs> Excuse me. All right, seeing none, please call the next. All right, next is item 30, text amendment 17003. Amending Chapter 27.67 of the Lincoln Municipal Code relating to parking by amending Section 27.67.030 to allow parking in the front yard in the R4, R5, R6, and R7 zoning districts when the property is used for single-family dwellings, two-family dwellings, and townhouses, and to allow required parking spaces to be stacked, and repealing Section 27.67 Point zero three zero as hitherto existing. Steve Hendrickson with the Planning Department. Also, Jim Christo, the applicant, is here in case you have any questions for him. Uh, this is pretty much a minor text amendment. Uh, Mr. Christo came forward. He was looking to redevelop some property uh, that is in the R5, R6, and R7 uh, districts. Um, and uh, specifically, this was an item where he wanted to do um, either have uh, two units attached to each other or potentially three or four units attached to each other and we realized our current code didn't allow for parking to be legally counted as part of the required parking if it was stacked behind a garage. It's something that's typically done in our R1 through R4 districts. In reviewing it we determined that it really made sense. We're in our multifamily districts also encouraging uh, townhomes or single family attached housing. Um, and so this is a, a relatively minor amendment that would allow us to count that in front of a garage. And that would allow Mr. Christo to have some uh, units that have a one car garage and count as part of his required parking, people with a parking space uh, behind the garage. Any questions? Great, thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to this item? All right, please call the next item. All right, next is item 31, approving a real estate sales agreement between the city and Kirk Havronic for the sale of city-owned properties generally located at 5122, 5132, and 5142 Betty Lou Boulevard. David Landis, Urban Development Department Director, and the applicant in this case. <clears throat> it has a ring to it, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Betty Lou Boulevard. <laughs> Um, this is the sale of three lots that uh, the city originally bought for $10,000 from the developer in the Glen Oaks area. Um, it was to allow the Glen Oaks area to proceed without doing uh, a relatively costly uh, linkage between um, the sewer, uh, I'm sorry, make that the stormwater in the area and the city's stormwater system. What happened instead was that uh, we took over the property and uh, we put in a box culvert high here and the water essentially would come into those three lots. Now that property is more valuable. You, you want to put that back and we didn't even get to see it get projected. See it. Thank you. Um, the box culvert is back in this area. <clears throat> that allowed the rest of the lots to be built without this relatively expensive proposition of making the linkage. 
And to do that, the developer sold back to the city these three lots for $10,000, and the lots were used to where the water went <coughs> when there was storm water. Well, now those are more valuable and are usable if you link the stormwater system to the city's system, which is the plan for the developer. They'll do that at their expense, not the city's expense. So that cost doesn't come to us. But um, they have agreed to pay us $73,800 for um, these, essentially, these lots here. We paid 10000 we sell them for 73800 We don't pay the price to link it to the sewers, to the, to the city's stormwater system. And we get um, what in this area quite likely would be, let's say, three $250,000 homes built on this land that is otherwise unused. We now pay maintenance on the property because we mow it. And because it's been platted and has no civic purpose at the moment, it will be taxed this year unless we sell it. We'd like to sell the property. Any Good questions? Show. Carl. This, this is unusual. <laughs> <laughs> this, usually when you come before us, it's the other, the other way. way around. So, yeah. so thank you. <laughs> you must have read The Art of the Deal. <laughs> I have to keep a share, you know, like a, like a finder's fee, like 10%, but I can't. It goes to the advanced land acquisition. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Would anyone else like to testify on this <coughs> item? Seeing none, please call the next item. All right, I'll call items 32, 33, and 34 together. They are approving the Nature's Variety Phase 1 Redevelopment Agreement, the fiscal year 1617 CIP to authorize and appropriate $275,000 in TIF funds, and authorizing the issuance of tax allocation bonds, all for property generally located at 311, 321, and 333 Southwest 32nd Street for the construction of an approximately 24,000 square foot freeze drying facility. Members of the City Council, David Landis, Urban Development Department Director, and the applicant in this case. About five weeks ago, you would have seen this idea before you because on March 27th, Council passed an amendment to the West O Redevelopment Plan for this general project will be part of the plan overall. It was unanimous, as was the Planning Commission's vote of uh, two weeks prior. Nature's Variety operates out of three locations in Lincoln. They want to be more uh, effective and efficient to make sure that they are continuing to be a solid uh, company with a bright future for the 120 employees that they have in Lincoln and the 150 employees that they have elsewhere throughout the country. Um, they would like to build in this location a special freeze drying facility that will improve again their efficiency. Um, to support that, uh, in addition to the existing employees, they'll need between five and eight uh, employees and an engineer at the location. It's a company that's been successful in the last <coughs> recent years. It's quadrupled in size over the last eight years. They hope to double in the next four. Um, this is the, the, the initial phase of their thinking. They're part of a, of a corporate uh, realignment uh, that has uh, their future mapped out, but this is um, the phase that they're currently uh, involved with in Lincoln. It involves a $3 million investment in that facility and the accompanying TIF is $275,000 that would be spent towards site acquisition. Um, this elevates Lincoln, I think, inside the corporate structure of Nature's Variety. That's of value to us. The linkage originally came uh, from the company to our uh, economic development arm of the mayor's office as they were looking for a place inside the company and various locations in which to make this investment. and. Uh, in discussions with us, uh, it was decided that Lincoln was the right place to do that. Tom Houston, the lawyer and a representative of Nature's Variety are here. They'll be happy to answer questions. And I, I would be happy to answer your questions as best I can as well. All right, thank you. Yep.
Madam Chair, members of the council, my name is Tom Houston. My address is 233 South 13th Street, Suite 1900 here in Lincoln. Uh, appearing before you today on behalf of Nature's Variety. With me today is Brett Holtz, who's a plant engineer of Nature's Variety. A little bit about the company first. They're a manufacturer of pet and animal food. They've been located in uh, Lincoln for many, many years. Their headquarters is in St. Louis. Uh, they really had historically three operations that they'd like to consolidate uh, at this Southwest 32nd Street site. They have been leasing the facility out on Southwest 32nd Street and have the op opportunity to purchase that facility. Uh, the, the phase one of this project is intended to be a 24,000 square foot freeze drying facility as indicated by Director Landis. Uh, this is the existing facility that's uh, uh, occupied and leased will be purchased. The new freeze drying facility is located in the southern portion of that property. Uh, it's anticipated that the um, investment on this facility will be between three and a half and four million dollars. Much of it is equipment related and obviously as you're aware equipment does not factor into our tax increment financing equation uh, but this site would create a, a potential 15 to 20 new jobs. Uh, it is anticipated too that there's a phase two of the project that would be a, uh, a cold storage facility potentially within about three years that would be f filling in some of the gaps on this site plan. Uh, one thing about this site, that the current building that they're occupying is approximately 40 feet below grade, not below grade, below the grade of O Street, so it's hard to even to see from O Street as you drive past it. Uh, uh, the, the redevelopment agreement that's in front of you does indicate that uh, the tax increment financing has been sized at $275,000, which is relatively a modest size for tax increment financing, but it's based upon our projection of a 24,000 square foot industrial building utilizing the formulas used by the Lancaster County Assessor. And uh, it's been our experience that that value comes in at approximately 50 to 60% of cost. And, and so we've tried to be very conservative in uh, our, our calculations of this. Um, it is anticipated that the, uh, the uh, building would commence construction at the end of May if possible. If this matter is approved, it's approximately a six to eight month construction cycle that would have the facility being open for operation early 2018. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have and I would ask for your support for this project. Any questions? Jane. Tom, could you just review again what are some of um, the infrastructure improvements anticipated? for the project besides uh, the difference in the I think as this elevation? phase one project, it does not, we do not anticipate any fa any infrastructure improvements exactly. Uh, the, the redevelopment agreement contemplates the use of the tax increment financing amount for site acquisition, which is clearly an eligible cost under the, the community development law. A, f a phase three project would definitely have infrastructure needs because of access issues on some of the targeted land. So uh, that could be a question in five or six years <coughs> based on the schedule. Thank you. Other questions for Tom? Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to this item? Good afternoon, Marty Lee, Neighbor, uh, Neighbor Works, Lincoln. Um, and this is the first I've heard of the project, so I just have a couple questions. One is with um, tax increment financing. I understand there's got to be a, an issue of blight, and I'm not that familiar with the area, but I would, I would be interested in what that, how that fits into this. Um, the other thing that I'm concerned about and would suggest even for future when we're doing TIF projects in Lincoln um, is that maybe a percentage, a small percentage of the TIF might go um, back towards the neighborhood for some improvements that are made in the area surrounding it. That's done in other parts of the country and um, I'd really like us to start considering that maybe. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Tom, would you like to address the concern raised? Sure. The this site is located on West O Street at approximately Southwest 32nd Street. It's located in the West O redevelopment area that was declared a redevelopment area and blighted substandard back in the st when the study was completed in 2006. The West O redevelopment area really starts at the bridge. Uh, 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 West 1st Street uh, extends all the way to Southwest 40th Street and uh, it's P Street on the north and the railroad tracks on the south. So it's a large corridor, long corridor that was declared by and substandard by this council's action back in 2006. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Tom? Well, okay, oh, Jane. Yeah, going back to Marty's suggestion, um, I know you're, you're sort of the guru of tax increment financing. Um, do other municipalities designate a percentage of that towards the uh, neighboring areas in improvements to those areas? 
Not as such. I, I mean, some cities do charge a, a varying amount of, of a percentage of the tax increment financing sum for, it still has to be an eligible purpose, it still has to be an eligible use under the community development law for redevelopment improvements within that specific project area. I've seen that happen. Uh, but the percentage varies from city to city. Uh, the city of Lincoln has not done that to date. The city, what, three years ago, two years ago, implemented the 1% administrative fee to help cover the administrative costs, which a lot of cities do that. Carl. How about uh, utilizing funds for low-income housing projects? I've heard some, yeah. some talk about something like that. Certainly, it's off topic, but I'm willing to talk about it. Uh, one of the challenges in using tax increment financing for affordable housing is it has, we have a different statute on valuation for low-income housing tax credit projects, and uh, it has to be based upon actual income, not market rental income. Uh, so as long as uh, uh, the, the projections include the statutory valuation model, then yes, t uh, TIF can be used for affordable housing. But not using a, you've indicated that, that the TIF for this project has to stay on this site. You, you couldn't transfer it to another site for a different purpose. The community development law allows the tax increment financing sum to be used within the redevelopment area. And that this, as I mentioned, this redevelopment area is a wide or long corridor oh, from, okay. from the bridge out okay. to, to 40th Street. Right. Um, some cities do that. Okay. Some cities capture a mountain, use it for sidewalks elsewhere within the redevelopment area, for example. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Teresa, please call the next item. All right, next then is item 35, text amendment <coughs> 16020, amending title 27 of the Lincoln Municipal Code relating to the zoning code by amending section 27.62.100, subsection C, subsection two, to modify the front and side yard setbacks for car sales and remove conditions that are no longer needed by amending section 27.67.040 to create a new parking requirement for motorized vehicle sales for lots less than two acres and repealing sections 27.62.100 subsection C subsection two and 27.67.040 of the Link Municipal Code as hitherto existing. Is anyone here to, all right, great, thank you. Good afternoon, uh, council members. My name is Ryan Glenn of Hush Blackwell, 13330 California Street, Suite 200 in Omaha, Nebraska. I'm here today to speak on behalf of the um, applicant who submitted the request for change in the uh, Lincoln Municipal Code um, that's before you here today. And my client is A&B Auto, um, which you're very likely familiar with, um, located approximately at 33rd and Cornhusker here in Lincoln. The text amendment that we have requested is in three parts, but the Planning Commission has uh, recommended approval with respect to the parking amendment to reduce the required parking stalls for employees and customers to three spaces if your lot is um, in size of less than two acres. And so we are, of course, in support of their recommendation on that issue, and so I would rather focus my time uh, with you here today on the other two remaining text amendments. The first one is with respect to the uh, side yard uh, reduction in H2 and H3 zoning districts. We have proposed that the um, side yard be reduced to zero um, in order to allow for motor vehicle sales um, to occur in the side yard. The current restrictions um, provide that for um, properties like my client's property, um, the side yard area is 15 feet from the uh, property line on the side of the individual's property. Um, that has 
a tremendous impact on uh, not only my client's property, but also several other business owners uh, within the H2 and H3 zoning districts, um, some of whom uh, are here with us uh, this afternoon that also intend to speak before you on these two measures. The side yard issue um, in the grand scheme of things, when you're looking at the comprehensive plan that has been um, submitted um, to the city of Lincoln to help you know, beautify the area, it really does not have an impact on that comprehensive plan as we have it proposed here today. And the reason I say that is because there's still in the proposed text amendment on the side yard issue, there still remains an exclusion for if the H2 and H3 zoning district property is located uh, next to a residential property, that does not apply. And so the current zoning restrictions for the 15 feet would still remain in effect if the property was located next to a residential area. With respect to the front yard issue that we have um, submitted, that is a little bit more complicated. And so the way that we have proposed it um, as a text amendment is that for properties in the H2 and H3 zoning district, the front yard would be reduced to six feet from the property line. And with that six foot barrier, we also um, have indicated that the design standards that are current um, with the city of Lincoln and certainly um, in conjunction and in support of the overall comprehensive plan to beautify the city of Lincoln, those design standards requiring landscaping as a buffer to the front yard for these H2 and H3 properties would apply. And so the properties in these zoning districts, including my client, would not be grandfathered and would agree to have the landscaping buffer and end up um, having a much better scenario than it currently exists today, in which there is a tremendous amount of non-compliance with the current zoning ordinances as they um, exist today. With respect to um, other options that may or may not be available um, to my client and others in this um, scenario, uh, there really are none. <laughs> Um, because if we were to submit a, um, for example, a variance request with the zoning board, um, we would end up needing to prove a significant hardship in order to do that. And it's just not very um, likely that that would end up um, successful because of the nature of the size of the lot in comparison with the overall footprint of the building and um, the area surrounding it. But by having these um, reductions in the front yard and the side yard, um, my client would be able to, um, ex to further lay out his property in a better manner in order to remain consistent with the comprehensive plan. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Would anyone else like to speak to this item? My name is Jesse Abel, and I am a manager for Quality Motors. Can you just um, state your address for the record, please, yes, Mr. Abel? Thank you. 5401 Superior Street here in town. It's 68504 for the zip code. Um, I do actually support uh, what she had just addressed with you folks. Um, just to kind of, I mean, it's, it's pretty... Um, self-aware, but I mean, most of these, myself included, these are local family owned and operated businesses. And uh, in order for us to be able to survive, we're gonna have to have a way in order for us to 
display our our nicer vehicles obviously because you know that's how we make our living and on top of that um you know the six foot it's going to be a hurt to the business we understand that but we can accept that but with the 15 foot that's literally going to kill the business and it's not going to give us an opportunity to display the vehicles that we have um, as well as that's going to make I mean, we're going to have to dramatically drop lot size in order for that to happen. And um, I mean, you know, being, you know, family owned and operated local type businesses, not all of them, but, you know, a lot are. And in order for us to be able to um, stand behind that and actually be able to, you know, feed our own families and things of that nature, um, I personally feel that we do, um, you know, definitely, I like the recommendation that's going. Uh, because that at least gives us an opportunity to display our vehicles, you know, so that people can see them as they drive by. And of course, you know, I definitely would stick with correspondence of what she had spoken to, you know, in the, in the, the thing that she had brought up for you guys. And I just wanted to have an opportunity to kind of voice my opinion and let you guys know, you know, how detrimental it is to the business as well as, you know, myself and my family and the others. Uh, that are in the same business that you know would be affected by the situation as well. Girl, thank you, and thanks for being here. Yes, sir. Uh, thank I was, you. How'd you hear about this? How'd I hear about it? Yeah, I had just talked to basically. I just kind of heard about it. I saw the thing on Facebook on the Lincoln okay. Journal Star, and okay. I just wanted to make sure to to come along and support. All right. You know. Well, well, good. I'm glad you're here because one of one of my concerns about this is is uh, how this you know, would impact uh, existing dealers and don't want to do anything that, that hurts your business, but we're also interested in, in how this impacts the city and, and other property owners along the streets that, that are have most of the used car lot. So, Absolutely. So it's, yeah, I appreciate your being here. Yeah, and it, and it wasn't just the used car lots. I mean, this is, this is going to affect the big car lots too, correct? And, you know, you know, it's just a business and I just want to make sure, you know, that the big guys are protected as well as the little guys. Okay, great. Thank you. Absolutely. Jane. So are you comfortable with that six foot setback, but with all the landscaping requirements? Uh, to be perfectly honest with you, the landscaping requirements, I mean, I could go without, but just to give me that extra, I mean, feat that, you, you know, she's willing to help out with, of course, I stand behind that 100% because, I mean, like I said, even the six foot with a shrub is going to be a lot better than, you know, 15 feet away from, from the actual property itself. Did you have a question? No. Okay. And could you just reiterate where you're what your company is and where yes, you're located? It's Quality Motors, and it's located at 5401 Superior Street here in Lincoln, and that's 68504. So you are existing business, um, and and are you currently out of compliance because you weren't aware of it, or how no, will this impact um, I, you then? Absolutely. I actually just opened doors um, two weeks ago. And I had already been aware of the six foot. I hadn't heard anything about the 15 foot until I read this in the news. Um, so I am compliance with the six foot. Well, matter of fact, I'm actually in compliance with your 15 foot because um, I haven't been able to get maintenance on the yard yet in order to be able to bring the vehicles out further. So, I mean, right now I'm 15 beyond feet away and I'm just trying to get it started and get it open for my, you know, for my family and for everybody. and. And uh, once I get the, you know, the landscaping and everything done as far as the yard mode and such, I want to be able to move my vehicles up closer to the actual, you know, street so that they can be seen. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to this item? My name is Susan Phelps and I run West O Auto on 2111 O Street. And with the drawback of us having to pull our vehicles back from the road, if we were to have to comply with the 15, I'd lose spots for 65 of my vehicles. And that would basically shut us down because I wouldn't have any of vehicles I sell. With having that drawback, I can do with the six feet and still be able to keep the business afloat and bring in a profit for our business. But with the 15 foot back, I'm only going to have room for about 30 vehicles, whereas I have a 
a lot where I can house almost 130 vehicles. But with that drawback, that's just going to devastate us too much. And I'm in agreement with what she had said with the six foot. We can be in compliance with that, but the 15 foot, that would just close our doors, along with a lot of smaller businesses down that street for some of the other car lots as well. Cindy. How long have you been open out there on West O? Almost two years. And um, did you buy a, a lot that was actually somebody doing business of a different type? Yes, uh, the business that we wound up renting over there, the property, was actually an old quick shop. And then we expanded to the neighbor next to us, and they were a car lot. Okay. So. And the, um, never mind, that's good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to this item? You can both come forward and we'll. Marty Lee, NeighborWorks Lincoln. Um, very much opposed to this. Um, we have been, um, there, the first that I heard of this, the issue was that um, we have an ordinance in place of 15 feet, but it's not, um, it's not enforced, and so therefore, let's change it and make it every, everything be in compliance. I'm sorry, but that's not the way that you work on, on um, beautification of an area. I mean, there was a reason for this ordinance in the first place. Um, the people that you're hearing from today have been in business. And so we are not shutting their business down. This is the way it has been. Um, I was concerned very much about the issue of residential areas next door, so I was pleased to hear that they've changed that because there's nothing worse than being in residence and all of a sudden seeing a bunch of cars parked in your front yard. Um, the other issue that I have is that um, a lot of these side yards aren't even paved. They're not, not developed. They're just grass lots. I'm sorry, but that's... In my mind, that's not a, um, acceptable for vehicles anywhere. Even in your own yard, you don't put your vehicles on grass. Um, if you look at the area around um, P Street and 22nd Street, we've got a whole block full of used cars. And I'm not opposed to used cars, but they're parking on the sidewalks, they're parking on the driveways. If we're talking about changing this to a six foot from the property line, and you're going to put some bushes, and you're going to have a sidewalk, and that's not going to happen. You know that's not going to happen. They're not going to be putting, if they're concerned about their cars looking, being visible from the street, they're not going to be putting bushes in front of there. I think we have to be realistic about this. It, um, I think it needs a little bit more work. Um, I'm, we're, we've talked to different neighborhood associations. We had the city planner look at all the different locations that could be impacted by this. Um, I just think that the idea of maybe expanding the, uh, uh, the number of parking spaces available for the employees is fine. I don't have any problems with that. But the other two issues that we're very much opposed to that. Cindy. Um, thank you. Thanks for being here today. Can, do, can you tell me where, when you said some of the side lots, that they're just grass lots, mm -hmm. do you have some um, examples 22nd of that? and P. I should have probably taken oh, some Oh, after 22nd and P? Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, that's just one. I mean, I haven't gone around and, and looked at everything. It's over by... Antelope Square and all that. But. And um, so NeighborWorks wasn't part of the Planning Commission's review of this particular request. Did you just not know about it? Oh, no, I knew about it. We've, oh. we've been involved from the very beginning with when this issue first came up a couple months ago. Okay. We were at the Planning Commission, talked there. Oh, okay, and so and I, I guess I didn't see anything in there about testimony, did you? I'm, um, well, we, I'll, I'll, that's we did okay. to staff. I'll, I'll ask did. Dave when he okay. comes up. Thanks so much for your coming today. Uh -huh. Would anyone else like to speak? Uh, members of the council, my name is Terry Barber. Um, I am a lawyer here in town. I represent the neighbor to A and B Auto Sales, which is a company by the name of SL Corporation, which is owned by Larry and Cheryl Snyder. Um, uh, I don't think I want to plow the ground that's already been plowed. I think you have in front of you the staff report, the report from the planning director and from the planning commission. And I think, unless I miscounted, 
all of the things that the commission noted in the in their uh, discussion of this matter have been demonstrated here this afternoon. Uh, we we haven't had enough go into the study of this. It's going to create too much chaos, and it looks like we're using or trying to use a text amendment to deal with a spot problem. Uh, so, uh, for the for the reasons that the, that staff made their report and the commission uh, voted only for conditional approval, I would simply urge you to do the same uh, uh, and, and uh, approve the reduction in parking spaces for the uh, two acre and, and uh, less lots, but uh, deny the text uh, amendment changes with respect to side yard and front yard. Thank you. 20 at 300 North 44th Street, number 205 in Lincoln. Cindy, thank you. Um, this, <coughs> thanks for being here today. The Snyders, are, aren't they the folks that, so, that have a purchase and sale agreement with uh, A and B for part of that lot that's on the corner? Uh, well, it's, it's a strip. I don't have a map in front of me. If you go to the steakhouse, and to the parking lot in the in the in the on the west side of the restaurant. Correct. There's a light pole. Okay, that light pole essentially defines the west boundary of the steakhouse lot. Okay. Okay, which really shorts them as far as display area. So what what we had proposed was to sell them the rest of that paving because that, that lamppost is in the middle of the paved area. And, and so th there is an agreement to sell them additional space to the west of the restaurant. Okay. And uh, at the time of the sale, did the Snyders know that the uh, folks are gonna be looking to, uh, to change the zoning? We had, we had, we had uh, because of the, the amount of space that was being sold, we had to make it subject to subdivision. There are two lots on the corner. One is 150 feet square that abuts the intersection itself, and then there's another lot, number 115, that is kind of a boot around that. Um, we had no idea. I mean, the, the, when the subdivision requirements came back, um, it was quite a litany of things that were needing to be addressed, which we hadn't anticipated, certainly not zoning change. Were um, one of the zoning requirements, I think that, um, I'm sorry, the subdivision requirements, as I recall, was to build a sidewalk on 33rd Street by the, uh, from the, the point of the railroad tracks and north to Cornhusker. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and has has A and B Auto agreed to do that in order to help with the subdivision if the purchase goes through? M my understanding is that they're they're willing to uh, split the costs of the subdivision. Okay, and are there any other um, are there parts of subdividing that lot that that uh, the Snyders are not comfortable with? Is could that be one of the reasons that they're opposing this? Well. It's, it's difficult to tell how many different wheels are turning at one time. There is concern about the, the logistics of this particular sales lot and its impact on the value of the corner, if that's, if that's the question, yes. Is there a, a, a separate and distinct interest? Yes, there is. Um, how, do you know how long it's been vacant? 2005. Thank you. You're talking about on the corner. Yes. Yeah, the, the buildings that were there were demolished in 2005 in May. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to this item? All right, do we need some staff questions? Anyone? Yep. Come on up. Uh, Andrew Theroff, Planning Department. Thank you for being here. Um, Jane and John. Could you explain the, the, the diagram that you put up on and, and what that represents? I wasn't catching it. Yeah. Um, so this is A and B's site uh, at 33rd and Cornus. There we go. Um, so this, this is A and B Auto. That's the old steakhouse restaurant. 
Um, they were going to do a final plat, or they have a final plat in process to move this line so that the entire A and B lot is on their own property. Uh, and we had notified them that they're in violation of a few zoning items. One is the front yard here. Um, it either has to be 20 feet or they can go down to 12 feet if they put in the landscaping. Uh, and right now they're at zero feet. Uh, and then on this west side, that would be a side yard, and the side yard's 15 feet, and they're, you know, they're at zero feet right now. And then they weren't meeting the required parking as well. John? Yes, uh, my understanding is that the administration may want to put this on hold and discuss it a little bit more. Has that been discussed as we would have it for vote next week? I'm just thinking if... If that is the case, we might want to leave the public hearing open, depending what changes might come about, if any. Um, I wouldn't say we want to put it on hold necessarily. Uh, I know one item that's I don't know, somewhat hanging out there is that in the somewhat near future, we'd like to do a, a more comprehensive look at Cornusker, West O, those corridors, those entryway corridors. So looking at you know things like setbacks, landscaping for all uses, um, so that would uh, perhaps shed some more light on what we should do about car sales specifically. Um, so we'd, I think we'd prefer not to do any action uh, uh, that would affect the corridor before a study like that is completed. But I mean, we're talking a while before that would be approved or even start. So, Well, where the city has not been enforcing the law on the books or the zoning on the books, if we had a delay or we just didn't take action on this pending this study, what would you do in the interim? Um, I think that would ultimately be a question for building and safety. Um, but right now it's it's on a complaint basis and I, I don't think there'd be any stepped up enforcement before this study were to take place. I, I could say that. Cindy. Thank you. We've had a conversation about this, Andrew. Thank you very much for being here. Um, I wanted to talk about a couple things like the one of the things that the gal from West O talked about was she took over an existing um, business property. And ha um, hasn't that kind of added to the noncompliance issue? Um, so, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll explain setbacks a little bit okay. in the area. Um, so in H2 and H3, parking is actually a zero-foot setback. Um, so you can have parked cars uh, up to the lot line, except new parking lots, we have our parking lot design standards where there's a six-foot screening buffer in place. Uh, but along Cornusker and West O, every parking lot basically predates that. So we have parking lots all along that, that stretch that have a zero-foot setback legally um, so those areas can be used for parking of cars, um, but they can't be used for car sales, display of cars for sale, unless there was uh, a car dealer probably going back to 1979 or beforehand. They would potentially be grandfathered in. Um, so it, part of it is a logistical thing. Now you have a zero parking setback, and now you're being asked to do... 12 or 15 feet or whatever, and, and screening, you would have to literally like tear out asphalt and concrete in order to do the screening in an existing business. Uh, correct. Um, so the setback today is 20 feet. So if you did 20 feet, you could right. leave the pavement and, I mean, you could have car parking in that first 20 feet. You just couldn't have cars displayed for sale. But yes, if you wanted to go 12 feet away, you would need to tear out pavement and put in landscaping. Okay. And so this, um, my understanding is if we went to the six foot, that the, um, the applicants have uh, agreed to do a 90% screening. That would be part of the six foot uh, change, mm -hmm. six foot setback, 90% screening just to beautify the entrance and exits of the city. Correct. Yeah. Um, so as you, right now they have a zero foot setback, they'd be putting in a six foot landscape buffer. Okay. Um, I think that'd be a great improvement at 33rd and 35th and Corasker that's been vacant and dirt basically since 2005. Thank you. Roy. I got to admit, I'm a little perplexed. So used cars that belong to a private citizen who drives on their lot and parks there are okay, but used cars for sale are not. 
Yeah, so it's, it's the way we look at it as um, the inherent differences between a parking lot and a car sales but lot. But there's still cars parked along the there's, street. Yep, that's correct. Um, but with a car sales lot, there's, there's basically always cars there all the time. Parking lot, there's probably some portion of the day where there's no cars parked there. Um, and for many businesses, the parking lot's never completely full. Uh, car sales lot also could have like you know stickers on the windows or balloons, just things like that. Um, and those are bad because? Well, from an aesthetic purpose, I think would be be the main question of cars parked right along the property line all the time, or you'll have with a with a parking lot. There's probably a lot of time where there's not actually any cars parked there. Okay. Any further questions? Yeah. Um, I, I appreciate the work that's being done on this from everybody's standpoint. It, it just, it seems like an issue that, that does need some attention. Um, I think especially about uh, some of the main streets impacted, uh, Cornhusker and Westo in particular. Uh, I'm not sure I counted them all. Uh, might may have counted some twice, but uh, from Northwest 48th Street to the Harris Overpass, I think I counted 20 used car lots on that, that stretch of road. And, and that's a, you know, it's an entryway right into downtown. And if there's some way that we could have some consistency there, which we have on the books now, but it's not, um, not enforced, uh, that would improve property values. We just had before this a, a hearing on another issue that you know, was trying to improve property values on the West O, and and this would help as well. So, um, I, I guess just speaking personally, I I would would like to see us uh, dig in and and kind of figure this out long term. It would be good. Jane. So I guess this is a little bit confusing. We we. We have a standard right now, but it's not being enforced. So we're asking to put in a new standard, and how is that new standard going to be enforced or in compliance? And then in the, the paperwork that we received, they talked about some places being grandfathered in. So yeah. it's, it's somewhat confusing, <clears throat> and it looks like a, a, a mismatch of, of ideas and trying to you know, work with the, the current dealers, but trying to get some compliance because what is the current standard? Is it a 12-foot setback or? Yep, so in H2 and H3, the current standard is a 20-foot setback is the setback for all principal uses. So buildings and everything is 20 feet. But car dealers, um, they get a little bit of a break. It's a 12-foot setback if they put in landscaping. Uh, so. Yes, that would be the closest you could be. It would be 12 feet with landscaping today. Um, yeah, and enforcement is on a complaint or complaint basis. Uh, from what I understand, the building and safety just doesn't get that many complaints. Um, I know they're looking at a potentially uh, new way to enforce this or a way to more systematically <laughs> address this in the future. Uh, I, I don't think there's a specific plan yet, but this has certainly brought the issue to light with, with building and safety. So do other municipalities, to create that enforcement, do they make them post a bond for, a, like, a landscaping bond to, to prove that they've actually done the landscaping work? Or, I mean, is that discussed in this? Or I don't think so, right? No, we haven't no. discussed how it would specifically be enforced. I mean, that would be more building and safety's uh, territory there. Um, I just know they're, they're looking at how to improve enforcement for car dealers. Roy, then John. Can you give me an idea? Do you have any idea of how many of these lots that are out there right now are grandfathered in to an old system? Yeah, um, and that's really the, the challenge is that, um, so in 2002, that's when this 12-foot setback was created. Mm -hmm. um, so say 2001, the H2 and H3 districts were, it was actually a 25-foot and a 30-foot setback at the time. Uh, but uh, in 2001, and I think until 1979, there was a special permit where you could get a special permit to encroach into the front yard if you were a car dealer. That went away in 2002. So there could be some car dealers that got that special permit 20 years ago. Um, there was just a small handful of those special permits we ever issued, though. 
Um, and then if we're talking about grandfathering, you'd probably need to go back before 1979. Um, mm -hmm. And if there were any car dealers operating then that have remained in operation as car dealers since then, they could potentially be grandfathered in, but again, whatever district they were in pre-1979, that still could have had a 20, 30 foot setback. So um, basically to determine if anyone's grandfathered in, it'd take quite a bit of site specific research on the history of any particular site. I would say very few are grandfathered in. I could say that. Okay, um, John. Well, I guess I'd like to make a motion that we put this on pending for two weeks and have a dialogue with the administration and see exactly what we're going to do. Um, I was here in the early 2000s when we looked at entryway corridors. I know <coughs> Jeff Fortenberry was on the council then, and we were, he and I were very <coughs> strict on that need to do that in Westo and other places. But I think uh, perhaps as the policies were brought forth that, uh, and in light of conditions that we just, we need to reevaluate what we're doing and rather than piecemeal it here, uh, subject these business people to enforcement. Uh, maybe we just hold off here and, and see in the next two weeks, and then we can say what we do from there, but I think there needs to be a dialogue outside these chambers. So that's my motion. I'll second the motion. Um, I would ask that the hearing be held open. I understand that as part of that in 02, mm -hmm. the Lincoln or the West O Business Association was involved also, <coughs> and we haven't really heard from them yet. Um, I would just, before we take a vote, though, if we could just ask if there's a deadline for the sale to take place, if we, you know, if there's anything we should be cognizant on that in that regard. And so if we could, if maybe the applicant could come back up, would that be all right with everyone? Yeah. Thank you. Good clarification. Thank you. Uh, with respect to your your question, um, there the purchase agreement um, contemplates that there will be um, a subdivision that is um, finalized through the plat procedure um, with the city, and this um, process that we've engaged in uh, became necessary in order to do that, and so I think the the delay of um, a couple of weeks if the council members so choose would be fine. Thank you. I'd like to amend that to be three weeks to the 22nd because the 15th is the meeting in which we will change councils, the new, uh, so that doesn't really fit too well. So it was Good moved point. by John, seconded by Cindy, and I accept that. I'm in the friendly amendment mm -hmm. from Roy to change that to a three week delay. Uh, and you said pending, is that, did you want it pending or just a delay I, with sorry, public hearing? I'm a date certain, it's not really pending, it's a, just delay it with a date certain, hold with, public with, hearing open. Yep. Thank you. I guess my one question though would be that if in fact this is a larger issue that you want looked at, is, is a date certain, I mean, do we think that that's enough time? Well, I, I think it's important to give some finality here to this particular motion and then if though through discussions, there's a decision to accelerate uh, an entryway corridor review or something, at least we'll have more definition. Right now it's taking a piece of the puzzle and I don't think that's good for the city, the neighborhoods, nor the businesses. Okay. And okay. do you want action on the 22nd then? Yes, under my motion. With public hearing and action. Any further discussion on the motion? I just I have a question for Ms. Glenn. Yes. Um, you, you spoke before <coughs> that your, your clients would accept a, a six-foot setback with landscaping requirements fulfilled. Um, can you talk about a mechanism that the city could put in place that maybe you've seen in your, your practice in Omaha that other municipalities have done on the enforcement side? Do they? Put a, for, request a bond um, while you're here. I mean, we can continue to this dialogue for three weeks, but what, what have you seen? Well, first and foremost, I think it would be important to have an, um, at least maybe one or two or even three informational sessions that are very um, widely 
publicized um, throughout the city of Lincoln for um, members in the H2, H3 zoning district so that um, there can be a kind of like a mini town hall meeting um, to explain this new zoning ordinance that is put into effect, um, explain how, um, I mean, just as, just as the other car dealers that um, were here before you um, explained to you, they understand that they're going to be subject to the new design standards and not grandfathered in um, as they may be now, but they understand the overall goal is to be able to have the six foot um, front yard setback and still maintain their business and their livelihood. And so I think information is key. Um, communication is key with everybody involved. Um, and with respect to a, a bond, um, that might be um, one mechanism that could be um, implicated to ensure that um, folks do it. Otherwise, certainly uh, more enforcement <laughs> by the city building officials um, to you know do random um, drive-by um, evaluations and observations and have more communication with these folks to tell them what the current zoning ordinances are um, and go from there. Thank you. Okay. So motion. we have a motion on the floor. Thank you. You can have a seat. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion on the motion to delay action with public hearing to May 22nd? Trent's very happy. He's not going <laughs> to be here for that. I was going to vote no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Please call the roll. Bellers? Yes. Gaylor Beard? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. No one else wishes to come forward. That concludes our public hearing portion. We can move into the voting session. I don't see anyone else coming forward. In fact, everyone's leaving. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Public hearing resolutions. Item 24 is Big Red Restaurant and Sports Bar as a Kino Satellite at 8933 Andermat Drive, introduced by Eskridge. So moved. Second. Second by John. Discussion? Please call the roll. Bellers? Yes. Gayla Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Item 25 is the report of claims <coughs> for the period of April 1st through the 15th, introduced by Eskridge. Second. Second. <laughs> Second by Roy. Discussion? Please call the roll. Fellers? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Item 26 is the interlocal agreement with county corrections for roadside litter pickup, introduced by Eskridge. So moved. Second. Second by John. Discussion? Please call the roll. Fellers? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Item 27 is the interlocal agreement with the UNL Board of Regents to provide, maintain, and update online food handler training programs introduced by Eskridge. So moved. Second. Second by John. Discussion? Please call the roll. Bellers? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Rebold? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Public hearing ordinances second reading are items 28 through 35. It says third reading, item 36, approving the 11th and P and Lincoln Commercial Club Redevelopment Agreement, introduced by Christensen. So moved. Second. Second by Trent. Discussion? Please call the roll. Bellers? Yes. Gaylor Beard? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried, 7 to 0. Item 38 is amending the fiscal year 1617 CIP to authorize and appropriate one and a half million in TIF funds for the project introduced by Christensen. So moved. Second. Second by Trent. Discussion? Please call the roll. Fellers? Yes. Gaylor Beard? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried, seven to zero. Item 30. You skipped one. 37? Did you do 37? Item, that was item 37. Item 38 okay. is authorizing the issuance of tax allocation bonds. Introduced by Christensen. So moved. Second. Second. Second by Carl. Discussion? Please call the roll. 
too slow. Fellers? Yes. Gaylor Beard? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried, 7 to 0. Item 39 is Street and Alley Vacation 17001, vacating a portion of the northeast corner of the intersection of South Canopy and N Street right of way. Introduced by Christensen. So moved. Second. Second by Carl. Discussion? Sure. This is that important piece of property that's so large. I wanted that one. <laughs> Please call the roll. Miller? Yes. Gaylor Beard? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Resolutions on first reading are items 40 through 43, and ordinances first reading are items 44 through 47. Now, Chair, I'd move for adjournment and also remind the citizens that tomorrow is election day. And we encourage you to get out and vote. Second. Seconded by Trent. Please call the roll. Fellers? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Motion carried, 7 to 0. We are adjourned. <laughs>